ladies and gentlemen, to MBR, or as we like to call it around here, Nothing But Rants, the show where I find topics that I'm oddly passionate about, and I pontificate upon them. These are not hot takes, but rather takes that I'm hot about. Shut up and grab some tape. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome into the Film Guy Network on a wonderful Thursday evening. We got a saying around here, last show, best show. We're going to knock it out of the park tonight for you guys. And I want to start tonight's show with a dreaded text message. The old, we need to talk text message. My married men, my, my, my men with some significant others in the world, you will understand and recognize this text message. The we need to talk text message will have you backtracking your steps faster and harder than when you lose your keys and your wallet at the same exact time. Do you have a similar set of text messages, boys, that uh, ring true? Like, you get this text message and it's like, oh shit, I'm in some hot water, something to go down. Oh yeah, like a, like a call me when you get the chance type Ooh, thing. Oh yeah, especially with a period at the end, like mm. yeah, no exclamation point yeah. period at the end. Mm-hmm. Exclamation point. Wife might have a question. Yeah, you know an important question. Hey, when does a window our tags expire? What's going on here? Period. No exclamation point. Yo ass is in trouble. What you got for me, Kirby? Uh, those dishes better be done when I get home. Mm, from the mother. Oh yeah. Yes, yes. That chicken better be thawed. Mm. One of those. Oh, I'm yeah. I'm five minutes away, or I'm pulling into the neighborhood. Oh. We're popping again. Damn it. That's not even on you guys. That's on me. So. Damn it. Who took a shit and didn't flush? Yeah. The, one of those text <laughs> messages. But the we need to talk text message. The we need to talk text message is very, very nerve wracking. All right. Very nerve wracking. Um, Damn it. <clears throat> We're good. We're good. Dang it. That ticks me off, man. We had a good little opening going right there and just messed up with some static. That's on me, guys. Um, but anyways. Every person has received that we need to talk text messages and got the willies, right? In the world of football, there's a very similar uh, text message or notification on your phone that you get as a player that will have some type of uh, reaction, very similar and very akin to the we need to talk text message. That message being, hey, team meeting, mandatory team meeting, X amount of minutes uh, in the next hour at four o'clock. You get the mandatory team meeting text message something is about to go down and it's never very rarely anything good okay you get the mandatory team meeting out of nowhere text message somebody has either stolen something out of the locker room y'all finna run to you puke uh somebody has died in the immediate family or program uh somebody finna leave uh the immediate program or something is coming down sanctions wise it is never ever ever rarely ever good except for in eugene oregon today in eugene oregon today when they got the text message of hey we need to talk. They got good news today from their head coach. Four. Who has goals and aspirations? Raise your hand up. All right, everybody got goals and aspirations. You know how you get those? You be the best where you're at. If that's how you reach goals and aspirations, that's how great things happen. It's not about worrying about the next thing. It's about worrying what's right in front of you, six inches right in front of your face. I want to remind you guys what that means. You guys that just got here don't know them. Right, but it means something to be an organ done. Everybody makes what? They all, they all make commitments to things that they're going to do. A lot of starters, the world doesn't have a lot of what? Finishers. We're finishers. I want to be here in Eugene for as long as Eugene will have me. This place has everything that I could possibly ever want. There's a little bit of a problem in society today with people looking for what's next and where where there's an opportunity. And the reality is, you know, the grass is not always greener. In fact, the grass is damn green in Eugene. If you're scared your coach is leaving, then come play for us. The Ducks aren't going anywhere, and I'm not going anywhere. Um, that Dan Lanning, pretty cool guy, huh? He's a dude. Chiller. Seems all, yeah, just all dude characteristics coming from Dan Lanning. Real chiller of a dude. Yeah. Just through the video, you can tell how, like, infectious, like, his vibes are and, like, how he can captivate a room so easily. Like, I, you believe in Dan Lanning when you watch stuff like that. Yeah, I think what, what the, the keynote uh, statement right there is if you want to achieve your goals – uh, continue to grow where you're planted, um, which I mean, I think we, everyone kind of hears that message and, and receives that message. But I, I have found like, I don't know about you guys, but my peers in my life, 
um, and my colleagues and, 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 and ma ma mainly my generation. My generation of friends, when they got into the workforce, they started doing this, right? They're climbing the corporate ladder by going from one job to another organization and they're just trying to get promoted one step at a time. And gone are the days where, you know, like I'm, I'm gonna reach the pinnacle, I'm gonna reach the top where I'm at. Um, and I think we've seen this even in the, like, especially in the coaching ranks. Um, but it seems like, you know, by all accounts, Dan Lanning is happy out there in Oregon. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in here in just a second. But welcome into tonight's show. We got a loaded one for you. What's left for Bama after Dan Lanning uh, announced today that he's going to be sticking around at Oregon and out there in Eugene as the grass is still green out there, so says Dan Lanning. Um, where does Bama rank in terms of job openings, right? I think the discussion needs to be had about is Alabama a great job because Nick Saban did a great job at Alabama or is Alabama a great job? We'll talk about that tonight. Do we see another Nick Saban anytime soon in the world of college football? Uh, what changes does this create in the SEC landscape? LSU made some defensive staffs uh, adjustments that need to be talked about here on the National Hour, so we will bring that some attention. But I want to bring some attention to our friends over at Prize Picks. If you run over to Prize Picks today, use promo code Brooks, you get a 100% deposit match. What does that mean? You put up to $100 in your brand new account using promo code Brooks, you'll get matched instantly with that. At one hundred dollars, you'll have a free hundo sitting there in your account to go get in on some Flex Friday tomorrow. Um, so make sure you're heading over to PrizePicks.com and using that promo code Brooks. Let's get back to landing right quick, gentlemen, guys. If Dan Landing is saying no to the University of Alabama right now at this point in his career, I, I think the first question is, what does that say about the monster he either has or he thinks he's going to have at Oregon to turn down this Ferrari that's sitting out there in Tuscaloosa? He's got the ultimate pitch right now to anybody and everybody that wants to listen to him. I mean, it took him two years to be the top candidate, essentially. Like, any list you saw put out about p potential candidates for Alabama, it was Dan Landing right at the top. So, for him to be the top candidate in just two years, and then for him to turn that down when a lot of people probably would have taken that opportunity, I mean, it says exactly what he mentioned of, like, I'm planted where I'm at and this is where I want to be. So, it immediately captures the attention of everybody. I mean, I think he certainly believes in what he can do at Oregon and what he's building, but I don't think that's the reason necessarily he didn't go. I mean, you got to Oregon two years ago. Mm. It takes a while to get your feet in the ground, to build a roster up, to build coaching staff, to build connections and such as that. Why would you want to burn that? And, oh, by the way, I have to go follow up the GOAT of all GOATs, where if you don't win a national title every other year, you're going to be deemed as a disappointment. So I think that's kind of what also enticed him to stay. The, the fear of following Nick Saban, I'm, I'm with you for almost everybody except for the guy who's out here going for fourth and three and is just – I mean, Dan Lanning strikes me as a guy who has no fear in yeah. anything in his life. So I don't know if that was necessarily one, but it had to play a role, you would imagine, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the stakes are only so high here at Oregon – like the pressure is only so high here at Oregon, um, at Alabama, it's it's instant. Like you have to compete and you have to do it at the level that the the previous guy did. Also, I mean, well. you win what a national title or two at Oregon, you're yeah. the best Oregon coach of all time. You, you, you know go what? down in history as the goat. I I honestly think that today's decision and today's announcement already entrenches him in this fan base as such because of the history that they have. Mm -hmm. Right? You hit the nail on the head. This proves to me the, these these statements from him and this turning down of of Alabama, whether he was their first choice or third choice, I would have to believe he was their third. We'll talk about it tonight. I think they called Kirby Smart. I think they made Steve Sarkeesian say no. And then they probably made Dan Lanning say no. I think that might have been the order of these things. But for him to say no to this program confirms that everything that he has been talking about, all the lip service that he talks about, how the grass is pretty daggum green in Eugene and how he thinks that he can build that place into what Alabama is. This statement meant this um, and proved all those things were true from, from his mouth. And the other thing, and this is the reason why I think this decision, whether he wins a national title or not, that'll, that'll be the rose or the, the cherry on top of, of what happened today for Oregon fans. This entrenches him into a different uh, echelon. Like, you think he had buy-in from that program and that fan base and that, that, uh, those football players previously? It's on a whole nother level right now because of what this program has gone through over the last four or five coaches, right? As soon as Chip, Chip Kelly leaves them to go uh, to coach in the NFL, right? They go with Mark Helfrich for three and a half years and they ultimately fire him, right? And then they hire Willie Taggart, right? Willie Taggart steps in for about 18 months, damn near kills a couple kids in some offseason workouts, <laughs> and then leaves the program at, to, to go take a job at Florida State. Right? And then they hire Mario Cristobal as an interim, and they end up promoting him and giving him the head coaching job. And guess what happens? Two years later, 
he, he wins a couple games. He has a 10-win season, damn near wins the Pac-12, gets beat by Utah a couple times, and now all of a sudden he's getting $80 million from Miami. Like, Oregon has been nothing but a stepping stone for quote-unquote coming home stories for the last three coaches. For the last three coaches, and they held on to this one. And you could argue, no, I wouldn't even argue. I would state for a fact, he's the best of all three. Like, he's the best of all of these coaches that have chosen to leave Eugene, and he turned down the big one. Like, we're, we're going to talk about where Bama ranks in terms of these schools and, and, and what's next for them and, and how good of a job is it really. But the machine is the machine. They are who they are right now. That is the biggest opening that we've seen in college football since, what, Georgia came open? Probably, or or yeah. maybe Texas came open. Yeah. We, can, we can argue about semantics. We can argue about who's number one of the top five schools. But, man, this is a massive job that he just turned down to stick out there at Oregon. So, again, man, like you think this dude had buy-in from boosters previously. He can – it's an open checkbook now. Like, he, it's, it's – hey, yes, sir, you can have what you want, right? Same thing from the buy-in from the players. Same thing from the buy-in from the athletic administration department. This guy will get everything that he wants out of this program moving forward. But there's still one remaining hurdle as the head coach at Oregon, and it will always be the hurdle at Oregon, right? We're going to talk about something called the five-hour radius tonight, all right? But recruiting is always going to be – not hard, but recruiting is going to be difficult at Oregon, no matter what, just because of proximity to talent, right? But here's the deal. Every one of these guys that we're talking about, not Chip Kelly. Chip Kelly was scheming it for the most part. But, like, Mario Cristobal proved you could recruit at a top five level at Oregon. Dan Lanning's recruited at a top five level at Oregon. Like, you can do all of the things that you want to. Now, will you recruit seven five stars in one class from the Southeast? No. You won't because the proximity to talent is just not reasonable to believe so. But um, I think this proves to me uh, everything that, again, he has stated about what he's ultimately trying to build out there at Oregon. And it also it doesn't confirm it's going to happen. It makes me feel as if it's going to happen at a higher rate and a faster rate than uh, it previous of this decision. Do you think that them being in the Big Ten now had any influence that. on this decision? I was about to ask So that. Your, your payroll and your budget immediately doubles. Um at least your income into the football operations department, whether or not that goes to your coaching staff. I don't know whether or not it goes to you or that goes to your uh, whatever, you know, um, but your, your budget doubles. You go from about $20 million, I believe, a year to about $45 million a year um, or whatever the Pac-12 TV distribution was previously. I guarantee it wasn't near what the Big Ten is because the Big Ten is higher than any other conference in college football. So, yeah, the, the, I mean, we're, we're in a supreme conference, definitely played a role. And, oh, by the way, like going into the Big Ten next year, who looks safer and stronger of a bet than Oregon like mm -hmm. going into that conference? Seriously, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, well, is Harbaugh going to come back? Is McCarthy going to come back? Like that's about it as we see a bunch of draft decorations. There, The junior linebacker at Michigan declared today. Coulson. So Colson committed or, uh, you know, announced he was going to the draft today. So there, there's a lot of – turnover in the Big Ten where, yeah, if you're if you're Dan Landing, you could look at this and you could say, hey, we've got a, a, a at least a, a two or three year path right here where we can run rough shot over the Big Ten. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's that is one of the big main answers. I don't know if, if Oregon's still in the Pac-12 this deal. Ba landing to Bama doesn't get done. Just and, dude, I, I think it is worth noting that, like, when you hear about a coach having a young family or a coach having a family of, like, 9 to 15-year-old kids, man, like – Look at Dan Lanning's bio, okay? Just look at his wiki page. Since 2015, his family's made eight moves. They've moved like eight times, okay? Since the moment he was a graduate assistant in Alabama, it's been ping-ponging all across this country, okay? And now he's got a job that's paying him almost, what, like eight and a half, ten million million, $10 million a year, Pretty okay, handsome. up in Eugene, Oregon, and he's got a top-five football program. Like, man, I, 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 I sympathize with a person who had all these dreams and aspirations – and you, you hip-hop all across the country, and you finally get settled, and you're there for two years, and you're having a tremendous amount of success, and now you have to have this big, like, offer put in front of you of, like, man, I'm, I'm kind of comfortable where I'm at. I kind of like where I'm at. Um, and I think that's ultimately – that's definitely where he ended up settling mm -hmm. um, is I like where I'm at in Eugene. Mm -hmm. All right. What is next for Alabama is the immediate question. And I think there are two names that everybody has circled – for some reason, and I want to talk about why Dabo immediately got nixed out of here, but I think I know why. But the two names that are hottest right now, Kalen DeBoer, obviously the, the, the head coach from Washington, and Mike Norvell, the head mm -hmm. coach at Florida State. Those are kind of the two names right here. And, and 
the DeBoer smoke is is really, really loud for one reason. It's not just because he was super successful at Washington. It's also because of the representation that he has sent or recently chosen, right? He has signed uh, or has been signed to be represented by Jimmy Sexton. And I know a lot of you guys listening tonight are SEC fans. So you probably know the name Jimmy Sexton or you're really smart football fans. So you know the name Jimmy Sexton. If you don't, Jimmy Sexton is the definition of a super agent. Like, there are super agents in other sports. Uh, Scott Boris is one in the, in, in the world of baseball, right? Uh, you got LeBron's agent in basketball. You got CAA in basketball. There are these super agents in the world of college football because players until recently didn't necessarily need representation. All of the representation focus was on, guess who? The head football coaches. Well, Jimmy Sexton, being the best representation representer of all of these football coaches, okay, represented all the great ones. As most recently, and in the, in the article that I could find, most recently in 2020, he represented 20 of the top 50 highest paid football coaches in all of America. And you guessed it. Of those 20, majority of those football coaches, uh, you know, resided in the SEC. Okay, so it, at one point, Jimmy Sexton represented 11 of 14 SEC football coaches. Like, the dude is the conference's agent. And, and one article I read, on I, I can't remember who wrote it, maybe The Athletic, but it, it basically stated, like, you think, uh, you think Greg Sankey is powerful in this conference? Uh-uh. Jimmy Sexton runs this conference. Was, it was how powerful they connote this dude to be. So, Caleb DeBoer signs with Jimmy Sexton, and immediately the, the tin hat theory start, or the tinfoil hat theory start rolling, like, hey, that, that's indications this dude's coming to the SEC. Boys, do you, do you buy into the notion that, like, hey, follow the representation, you'll follow the actions and the causation to these things? I mean, yeah, I would think so. I, I think that whoever, like, you have your money linked to, wherever you're trying to be, I mean, regardless of, like, how personal you are and how personally driven you are, I mean, if, they, if, you, if you have a person as powerful as Jimmy Sexton, I think you're always going to be linked to things like this and you're always going to be led to things that can, can know what he's also involved with. It's definitely something to look at. I think it's definitely going to play a factor into who gets hired now mm. just because Sexton obviously has more leverage than any other agent in sports, honestly. But I don't know if that's going to be the deciding factor or if that's really what's going to be, oh, X person got this job because Jimmy Sexton was their agent or Alabama hired this person because Jimmy Sexton was the agent. Mm -hmm. So if DeBoer is the guy, right, I, I have a couple of thoughts about this, right? First of all, all the dudes ever done is win, like at the Division II level, on into the Pac-12 level. Uh, Fresno, I think he was at Fresno State or some some Northwestern mid-major Somewhere school, out there. Okay, before he got to Washington and continued to win at Washington, right? Um, but you, you, you guys know this, and everybody's already talked about this one with the idea of anybody coming into this conference that is a foreigner, okay, to the Southeastern Conference. You got to recruit at a different level down here. We already know DeBoer has not done that. Like he has not recruited at a level even this year where they're winning, uh, you know, on the run to win a uh, potentially a national title. He's recruiting like the 60th range right now in the Power Five. Okay, so it's not great. All right, with regards to his recruiting, that can't happen down here. Not just from I'm not saying you can't win without recruiting at a high level, but your boosters aren't going to be satisfied. Like one of the biggest things down here is acquisition of talent. It's it's the it, Alabama put it out in their statement. We are looking for a coach who can recruit, develop, game manage. It wasn't game manage, develop, recruit. All right, it was recruit, develop, game manage. That was the requirements to be the Alabama head football coach. DeBoer has not shown, or at least does not have a track record, not saying he can't do it, of doing the elite level recruiting. You also, you don't have to just recruit at an elite level down here. You got to really schmooze down here, all right? You, you got to be likable. I think Brian Harson learned this really, really quickly, right? If you're not someone that can be a little bit of a salesman, all right, and you don't have the cachet of a 2004 national title at LSU, and you can tell boosters to F off, you know what you're doing, then you have to be able to kind of kiss ass a little bit. And I think that's the other thing that a lot of people aren't talking about with this idea that DeBoer might be coming to Alabama. Everybody's doing the recruiting thing, recruiting thing, recruiting thing. But here's the deal. No matter who takes the job at Alabama, the price went up. And I'm not talking about the coaching price. I'm talking about the roster price. Okay, because let's let's be very honest and forthcoming about all of this stuff. We understand nowadays that name, image, and likeness, and essentially pay for play, is a major contributing factor to everything regarding regarding player acquisitions. Okay, so let me tell you something, and let me be very honest. Alabama has received something I would call the Saban tax as of late, meaning 
I don't receive as much money to go to Alabama because I know I'm going to play for Nick Saban and I'm guaranteed to win a national title during my time there. Well, guess who's no longer going to Alabama for a lesser price? Guess who's no longer getting the five-star that they're competing with Ohio State or Notre Dame or Texas or Georgia? Guess who's no longer getting it at an 80% clip that they might have been getting years past because Nick Saban was there? The new coach. So the new coach, not only in DeBoer's case here, has to go from a place where at Washington, he had to get boosters to give a shit. He had to get boosters to care about football at a high rate, at a national to con title contending rate, right? He's going from that to now going to a place where he's going to have to essentially talk boosters off the ledge left and right. I got to stop with you guys. Y'all are doing too much. It's too much Texas high school football, Friday night lights type shit around here. He's going from one place where please, please care to the next place. Please, please trust me. I'm good. All the while telling these guys to trust me and probably having to ask for more money. Guys, do you believe this, this idea and this, this take, if you will, that I'm um, claiming stake to, because I haven't heard it anywhere else, that not only is it a matter of, damn, you got to live up to Nick Saban, but if you're going to maintain this roster, it's going to cost you more money. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the only, count, only counter argument you can make to kids of like anybody of wanting NIL deals of like of – Sure, this school might be offering you something, but this is the trade-off if you come here. Sure, we might knock some percentage points off of what your payment would be, but you're also going to win more games probably here. Like you said, we can pretty much guarantee that you're going to win a national title here. Other places cannot offer that, but you can't make that argument anymore with a new head coach. Not pretty much. During his 15-year run, as uh, there was 15 straight years where Alabama was ranked number one at least one week of the AP poll. During that 15-year run, if you committed to the University of Alabama, signed your L or national letter of intent, and played there for four years, you were guaranteed to win a national title. That's nuts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, that is. I'm not saying that's no longer, but I'm saying the guarantees of that are no longer right. Like you, you can't just walk into rooms and say, "Well, we're Alabama now." Yeah, you are. Okay, but now Alabama has to pay what Tennessee has to pay, right, or whatever. Right, it's no longer come to Alabama. You'll be developed under Nick Saban. We get to pay you less. It's, it's that's not it. So again, you got to go in and you got to ask for more money, and that that's wild. You you are unproven at that school, and that's a really tough gig um, to start with. Not not only that, um, which is why I think DeBoer might be the guy. Right, if you're if you're not going to be able to maintain the roster talent, at least to start. The first two or three years, whoever the next head football coach at Alabama is not going to recruit at the rate that Nick Saban did for the last 16 years. Fair? Oh, hell no. Okay, fair. So if you're not going to recruit at the rate that he is, just because it was an astronomical rate, then you have to be able to do more with less. DeBoer, very, very good at doing that. We have seen that, right? He has developed and done more with less at every single program he's ever gone to. And like we said, he's done nothing but win. But if you're under the mindset that you have to maintain, maintain this roster – I don't think that would be the way that you would go with this decision. You might be looking into more uh, guys like Mike Norvell, who just got caught up in some shit down there at Florida State. Um, because even though he is in some NIL sanctions, and even though the NCAA is going down to penalize Florida State with some of the heaviest stuff um, regarding Mary Smims, believe it or not, um, even though that's all happening, at least he's shown a willingness and an ability to recruit um, down there at Florida State. So that that's kind of what I would pitch these two guys – um, to an, an Alabama fan base with, right? On one hand, you got a, a coach that can do more with less, and he's going to have to. And you have this other coach who has a proven track record in the Southeast of not only winning football games, but doing so at a high, high recruiting rate uh, on your roster. Yeah, I mean, there's there's not a, a perfect answer to either one. The best answer is you keep Nick Saban forever, and he just coaches until – time ends or the world ends but obviously that's not possible so now you have to kind of weigh the the lesser of two evils what's going to be here you know do we focus on getting this roster developed and maintaining that because that's proven to be the way you succeed in college football or do we go to a guy who's gotten really good x's and o's because that's also a major factor of winning games is you have to be able to manage your roster on the field why do so why do you think it is these two do you think it is these two names now because yeah. of those two reasons so I think it's these two names because it's where they've they've kind of fallen. Um, so I no think, lane train. I know. I think their I think their very first phone call was Kirby Smart, hmm. and Kirby Smart was either and it wasn't even Kirby. It was Jimmy, right? He called. They called Jimmy Sexton and said, "Hey, what's it going to cost?" Um, I had heard rumors that Texas A and M threw the number twenty out, twenty million dollars a year. 
you know, five years, 10 years, whatever you want. Was this after Jimbo left? Yeah, this is after Jimbo left. That, that, that was the number that I had heard. And from people that I talked to today, that was going to be the number that Alabama – like Alabama apparently has way more money than I ever imagined. Um, apparently there's some uh, coal mining money left in Alabama. Apparently there's uh, – uh, Bob, Paul Bryant Jr. has a, a, a bunch of money out there. There's another booster that I'm forgetting here as well. Okay, apparently there's – money is not an issue at Alabama. And, oh, by the way, they're the only college football program in the last 20 years to not have to pay a buyout. Okay? So they, they've got they've got, you know – save for a rainy day oh, man, fund I didn't think about that yeah they've got save for a rainy day fund um at alabama so money is going to be no issue here um so i would assume they've already gotten no's right they've gotten no's from kirby smart and after that they probably got a no from steve sarkeesian and after that they obviously called dan landing and got a no and now i think we're here at the DeBoer and we're here at the norvell sweepstakes of things and then after that you mentioned lane kiffin I think Lane Kiffin would be a tremendous uh, coach at, at Alabama. I think Alabama would provide him the one thing he never had at Ole Miss or will never have at Ole Miss, which is consistent ability to recruit in an elite level. Um, and that would be awesome for him. I also think there is a life lesson to be learned here for every young person and every person listening to this right now, which is don't burn bridges. I would imagine there's some boosters at Alabama and there's some pe people in that administration building that probably don't like the way that Lane Kiffin left that university. OK, um, he's the first and only football coach that ever left that place uh, with some stain on him. You know what I mean? Like everybody gets it's, it's, it's a common joke in this in this industry. You want to get your your image rebranded, go to Alabama, be be an analyst and then be a coordinator. And then, boom, you got a head coaching job. Well, he was the first guy that they ever was like, hey, man, just get, just go. Like, I know you just got the FAU job and I know we got a national championship coming up in a college football playoff, but just go just get out of here. We'll have we'll have Steve Sarkeesian step in and call plays. Like that, I, I think the way he left that place pissed a lot of people off. Um, or else, and here's how I think. There's here's why I think it's the number one reason why I think this. If if Lane Kiffin were an option, that dude would already be in Tuscaloosa with his name on the dotted line. You think he don't want that job? Like you think he doesn't think he could be the next one? I would imagine he thinks he's great, just like everybody else thinks he's good. Um, you know, so I, I would imagine that if they called Lane, there would be no hesitation. Yes, I'll take the job. I think it's also a sign of when Greg McElroy came out and said that there's 0% chance that Lane Kiffin gets this job, a guy that played at the, at the University of Alabama, still is connected to the University of Alabama. Like, obviously, if he's saying that, if he think there, I think that he kind of speaks for the crowd of people who do have some disdain still for Lane Kiffin, and he kind of represents the crowd of people that don't necessarily still care for Lane Kiffin. But I agree with you. He would have already been there if that was the case. So, yeah, I think Lane Kiffin's out because he's burned bridges at Alabama, but why is Dabo not a guy? Oh. Um, <laughs> so, Dabo's going to get a phone call. I, was, I can't remember who I, I was listening to today, but they were talking about this. Maybe it was Bruce Feldman. Um, they mentioned that – I mean, it's, this is public knowledge, by the way, because these contracts are public knowledge. Yeah. Um, it's in Dabo Sweeney's contract that you know, every, every one of these coaches has a buyout for themselves. Like if they want to leave, they have to pay the school X amount of money. And if the school wants to fire them, they have to pay X amount of money. It's all slotted based on how many years of the contract, all that good stuff, y'all know this. Um, but apparently in, in Dabo Sweeney's contract, the buyout for every other school, so if he were to leave and go to Texas A&M, it's X amount of dollars. But if he goes to Alabama, the fee's significantly waived. So he had his agent write in a clause to basically give him a, a cheaper out to potentially go to Alabama. Mm -hmm. So in terms of does he want it, Dabo can stand in front of God and everybody else and tell me that he wants to stay at Clemson and Clemson's the way where, where everybody's called him to be and all that good stuff. And we can do that, but your contract says something else, okay? And your contract says that you have an opening to take that Alabama job whenever you want. Um, so he wants it. The question is whether or not Alabama wants him at that at that point and it's crazy it's crazy how you can go from being ooh, is Dabo Sweeney gonna surpass Nick Saban as the greatest coach in college football we're five years removed from that happening by the way like that was what 2019 2018 people were out here talking about you know the end of Trevor Lawrence's run or the middle of it. everybody's like ooh, Dabo Sweeney creeping up on Nick Saban and now here we are a couple years later and everybody's like I don't want him they, yeah. they got fans outside of Nick Saban's uh statue out there not putting a Bear Bryant or a Scam Newton jersey on the statue, um, but out there talking about uh, F Dabo Sweeney, no Dabo Sweeney, no Dabo Sweeney. Um, crazy, crazy how quickly you can fall down the mountain of, of college football. Now, 
that's fans talking, right? Mm -hmm. Is has there been mutual discussion? I would imagine so. But yeah, I the ultimate the ultimate reasoning for no Dabo, I would imagine if you're Alabama, is the reluctance or the reluctancy to bend, right? The mm -hmm. the inability and the unwillingness to meet the the sport of college football in the middle. We watched that Reese Davis interview before we came on. Uh, or you listened to it, I watched it. Reese Davis asked him if this had anything to do with the the way in the world of college football now. Is this are you leaving because you don't like the way the the sport is? And he basically said, "I've never allowed myself to ever complain about the world uh, that we live in, right? Or how the world of college football is working. I have found a way to compete within it, right? Don't complain, compete. That's what I wrote down, right? Mm -hmm. Don't complain, compete. And that's been his whole mantra about all these changes in college football." Whereas on the other side, man, like Dabo seems like he wants to take his ball and go home. And that's not going to be an option. That's not going to be an option at Alabama. They care way too much about talent acquisition. I mean, I think another thing you have to look at is Dabo's way of coaching and it's kind of his philosophies are proven old school at this point. They don't really work. I mean, the, the whole idea of I'm not going into the transfer portal, I refuse. Look how it's turned out for him over the last three seasons. Mm -hmm. So to come to Alabama, to, to come to it, to be a new head coach at a school, you pretty much have to go in the transfer portal. Otherwise, your team's going to not be very good for two or three seasons, and the fan base is going to very quickly turn on you. So, yeah, I think Dabo's philosophies are also what's going to keep him from getting that job if he wants it. I think it's definitely the head coaching process. While it has been very brief still, I mean, 24 hours basically now, I think it has kind of worked out the way that outsiders, non-Alabama fans expected it to work out of – I think in some aspect of things, Alabama fans expect to like, well, we'll have the pick of the litter. I mean, everybody's going to want this job. And now I think it's quickly come to find out that not everybody wants that job. And it may not be your number one hire or even your 1A or 1B. It might even be number three on the list who you want. So yesterday when the news dropped, I hopped on here and did a breaking news you know, piece. Just rambled for 20 minutes, whatever came to the top of the head. And uh, about midway through, we were doing candidates. Like, hey, who could take this job? And uh, I mentioned Tommy Reese. And some people in the comments were like, Tommy Reese, that's where you lost me. Like, no way, Tommy mm -hmm. Reese. Tommy Reese's name getting brought up very often in the last 24 hours. Hmm. Uh, I got another one for you that I'm going to beat everybody else uh, to. And this one, I had, I had to Google to confirm it was the dude that I thought it was. Okay? Um, and I, I almost don't even trust myself to, to release this because when it was given to me, I didn't believe it. But I'm, I'm going to do it. Uh, Mike Loxley's name got brought up to me today. And here's why. Mike Loxley was an assistant. You're Googling him right now, aren't you? I'm Mike Loxley was an assistant uh, at Alabama, offensive assistant. And apparently a bunch of the uh, former players at Alabama have, have pinned him as the next one. I'm talking like big, big name former players. I'm talking about guys like uh, Tua Tagovailoa. Hmm. Okay. Huh. Uh, some of the goats. And here's, here's how this happens, right? Um, getting your former players to agree on who the hire is going to be is very, very important at a lot of these college football programs. And the way that – because you don't want some of your most high-profile former athletes bad-mouthing bad, bad your college coaching decision, no. right? Um, and so what these athletic directors do is as soon as a job comes open like this, they start calling around. Say, hey, who, who do you think? Who, who have you had good relations with? Uh, who, who do you think would be a good representation of our program? And uh, some of the players apparently today came back with the name Mike Laxley. Crazy. Who's and the source that gave it to me was like, go check it. I'm pretty sure they scored way more points against Michigan this year than <laughs> Alabama did. <laughs> <laughs> they did. Which is true. They did. They, I think they scored 35 um, or whatever it was. Who's the guy that Alabama hires and the fan base goes? Bill O'Brien. That's who we wanted. Oh, I thought you were going to go irate. <laughs> I, thought no, you were I, mean, go irate. I, think, I think it's a lot of people that the fan base would get pissed off about. But who's the guy yeah. where the fan base is going to go, this is who we want? I mean, I think Dan Lanning was the answer, but obviously yeah. that's not happening now. So. I was talking to somebody at Georgia about this, and I, I honestly think the Alabama fan base would be very accepting of Glenn Schumann. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, I, re I really do. I think they would they would be okay with that with that decision. Um, but yeah, I think outside of that, I think they're going to be. I, I'm not going to say disappointed, but it's it's hard for me to believe that if it is Mike Norvell, right? If it's Mike Norvell, are they going to feel like uh, he's like? Are they going to be warmingly acceptant? Of, I've already seen Bama fans going out there talking about should we question his culture because of the Orange Bowl, like they're they're already doing the is this really the guy you know which which is the thing you're supposed to do as a fan you're supposed to be questioning too. What a turn of events that would be though for Alabama to get the nod in the college football playoff and then 
a month later, Mike Norvell is a head coach at Alabama and leaves Florida State. Breaking news. Can't Mike Norvell enjoyed. opts out of Florida State's 2024 <laughs> season. Um, <laughs> that's not funny. Um, it is kind of funny. It is kind of funny. But, no, I don't, I don't know where they go next, but it, I think it's going to be I, – I would make sure it's a big name. The Mike Loxley thing would – oh, my God. Yeah. They would go nuts. They would go absolutely nuts if that were the case. I don't even think – I don't even think Tommy Reese would be – I don't think Tommy Reese no. has had a long enough oh, time God, there no. to do well, even though he, how well he finished the year. I don't think he's done enough there to just – like if, if Kirby Smart would have retired in the middle of the 2022 season – Georgia fans would have been like, okay, Todd Munkin, I'm fine with it. He's been here three years. He's done a great job offensively. We know he's great. Like, if he doesn't stay here, he's going to go somewhere else anyways. Like, Tommy Reese, I don't think Bama fans feel that way, even though they maybe should, right? He's one of the the younger, hotter offensive coordinators and offensive minds in the sport. Do you think it's weird that Dion's name hasn't had more of a, pr- a presence in this? No, because I, th- I think Dion's statement has been very clear. It's been very clear. I'm not going anywhere until my son's out of here. Well, you know, Nick Saban said I'm not going anywhere too before he switched jobs. I, I'm I'm just talking about the the actions that he's every every step of every decision that they've made at Colorado screams two years, two years, two years, two years, two years. Not even that. Why would why would if you're Alabama, why do you want Deion Sanders? Mm. Other than I mean, you're Alabama. You don't need a high profile and big name coach this to prop you up. This is a good point here. You don't need you don't need TV ratings. Well, no, Alabama. I'm just saying. Like, I'm just shocked at the fact that his name hasn't even been thrown yeah. out there as much as I thought it would be. Not that yeah. not that Alabama would actually be sodding after him or anything like that. Right. But the fact that the and media it ain't even leaked out here by Pete yeah, Campbell. knowing how the media operates and knowing what they did with Dion's name for the first four weeks of college Hell, football. On three didn't even put him on a graphic. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think it's honestly because the media jumped the gun early in the season on calling the best coach ever, and is he the next Nick Saban to the point where the college football fan base has essentially bullied everyone who's a media personality and saying you're an idiot for thinking Deion Sanders is good to now it's kind of you've kind of regressed back to the mean where Deion Sanders is looked at as a high profile coach that can be exciting but at the same time has proven absolutely nothing. Hmm. All right, so let's transition this discussion. As I ask the the chat right now, we got a bunch of people in here watching tonight. First of all, thank you. Welcome in. If it's your first time watching us tonight, we do this every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday here during the offseason live from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock. We spend an hour talking all things national college football uh, here to start the show. So welcome in. Make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, and rate, review, and all that good stuff. We are glad to have you in here. Uh, still on our – I don't know what our next goal is. Maybe 25K by, you know, February or something like that. I don't know. We got goals. We'll reach them eventually. 25K by the Super Bowl. What's that, February 2nd? February uh, 7th, something like that? 11th, I think. All right, 25K by the Super Bowl is our next goal. So let's see if we can push that up uh, with a little bit of your help tonight by hitting that subscribe button if you haven't already. A uh, lot, of, lot of discussion, right? Or at least there should be some discussion about where Alabama ranks in terms of job openings, right? If every job were open in America in college football, where would Alabama sit there? And I think this discussion needs to be prefaced with the fact that, like, is Alabama a great job because Alabama's a great job, or is Alabama a great job because Nick Saban did a great job at Alabama, right? And I think the two can both be true, right? We have seen two of the greatest football coaches in the history of the sport from one school. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think over the time span of college football, Alabama, the state of Alabama has proven they really care about it. It really does mean more at Alabama. And and that was the discussion that I had with somebody today. They were talking about the before Dan Lanning announced that he was returning, it was, man, you know, Phil Knight got a lot of money. And I said, Phil Knight does have a lot of money. Phil Knight does care about football. Phil Knight does donate to football. But the state of Alabama cares about football and the state of Alabama pours into football, which automatically makes it a top job because they care more about the sport that you're going to coach than any other sport at the university, which means you're going to get pull, you're going to get sway, you're going to get all the resources that you could possibly imagine um, at a school that is has a plethora of resources. So when I texted the coaches today, hey, who's your top five jobs? Like, what is it? There was a consensus five schools, okay? And in no particular order, those schools were Georgia, Bama, Ohio State, Texas, and USC. Is there any disagreements there of those five schools? Because that was kind of like, you know, half dozen to a dozen coaches' opinions. Off the top of my head, no, I think that's a really solid list. You could maybe wedge LSU in there somewhere, but yeah. 
Other than, no, I, I think it's a solid top five. All right, so if those are the top five, um, those are the top five. Alabama fits in there. And Alabama, the one that, like, you know, not in a major city, you know, not – not uh, they're historically great but not flashy like Tuscaloosa. Come on, man. Yeah. Like, you know, Alabama doesn't produce NFL players at a, at a rate like the state of Florida does or the state of California does or Texas or even Georgia. So how is Alabama amongst this list? And the term that I kept getting brought to my face, five-hour radius, five-hour radius, five-hour radius. And I'm like, I've heard this term before, and I, I think I know what it means, but, like, what does this five-hour radius term mean? And what the five-hour radius is, it is a known theory in college football that five hours is about the threshold of a reasonable commute, right? Once we get outside of five hours, people and recruits start asking for plane rides. Hey, can I get a plane there? It's a six-and-a-half-hour drive. I'm not making it. I'm not going to be able to make it. But for some reason, inside that five hours, people feel like they can make that drive. All right, I don't have to pay for flights. I, all right, so we're going we're gonna to break a, a, a wall down here, and we're going to be very, very honest with our audience here. The most commonly broken rule in the world of college football is the inability for schools to pay for unofficial visits. And I'm here to tell you right now, Johnny the Five Star from Lakeshore, Texas, okay, that ain't got a penny to his name, is not affording the trip all the way out to Athens. Okay, he's not going to be able to. So who you think's picking up the tab? Uh, same thing for Tuscaloosa, same thing for Ole Miss, same thing for Ohio State. Okay, the most commonly broken rule out here in college football is the idea that people ain't paying for unofficial visits. I'm here to tell you that's a little uh, fugazi. Okay, they don't all break it out the ass, but everybody's breaking it a little bit. And you know what helps you not have to break that rule all that much? The five-hour radius. So, what does the five-hour radius look like at a school like Alabama? You can argue they've got the best five-hour radius in the sport. What are we talking about, Johnny? Let's put it up on the screen here. All right. So, within a five-hour radius of Tuscaloosa, all right, you can drive and you can recruit players from Metro Atlanta. You can cover all of Memphis and basically all of Tennessee all the way up to Knoxville, which, let's be honest, not a plethora of five stars up there. All right? Hey, but guess what? We get our stretch all the way out to New Orleans. We get all of East Louisiana. And guess what? We can recruit all of the state of Mississippi. All the state of Mississippi. Oh, and guess what? We can also dip down into the panhandle. Okay? So in this region of the country, I would argue... If you were to look it up per capita per year, I would argue that this five-hour radius produces more Division I Power 5 football players than any other region in the country. Okay, this five-hour radius covers more than anybody. If you look at Georgia's, Georgia's five-hour radius from Athens, which is about right here underneath Augusta, right? This five-hour radius from Athens really goes up until the Carolinas and kind of dips down into North Florida right here. It's a relatively decent one, right? But we're not getting into Mississippi. You're not getting into Louisiana. You're not getting barely into East Texas. Okay, if Alabama really wanted to stretch this five hour into a six hour, get out to East Texas, they can definitely do it. So this, uh, this proximity to talent, it's a, it's a term you hear a lot of people talk about when they talk about these job openings. Proximity to talent is a major, major selling point for a lot of these football coaches because again, think about this. If I'm at USC, right? And let's take out paying for unofficial visits in general. Let's talk about just the commute. If I'm in Alabama and I have the ability to see these players at a much, much higher rate, meaning I get to see them more opportune, more times, I'm probably going to hit more times on those kids than I would at another school where they're, they just can't come get – I can't get to them very often. Whereas in Alabama, I might see the same kid from New Orleans seven times by the time he's a sophomore to the moment he's committed. I mean, I don't even know if you can recruit the entire state of California at USC, knowing how like large and long that state is. So absolutely, the fact that you are basically in the heart of the South, the literal heart of the South, and you can reach into so many different states in that region of the country, it absolutely is an advantage to your program. And guess what? This is, this is real nerdy. This is real college football over here, though. That stadium and that campus is a rocks toss off of I-20. It is right there in the, one of the biggest, most traveled highways in the country, all right? Your ability to get to Texas and your ability to get to Atlanta is one straight shot. That's it, okay? It's not, it's not even like Athens. In Athens, to get to Alabama, I got to drive down to Atlanta and then west. 
and Alabama, baby. It's just east and west, and that's it. So this this proximity rule, they're always going to be around great talent. Um, it's why LSU is as good as they are. LSU's five-hour radius is nuts, right? Yeah. It's absolutely crazy, and it's why no matter what coach is there, whether he's a grass-eating uh, Kansas dude or whether he's a I jog with my shirt off and hit on blonde women, a uh, Cajun monster named Ed Orgeron, whoever it is, <laughs> that joker going to win national titles at LSU because their proximity to talent is so great. Hmm. So now, with that said, how would you rank – the, the five schools that they gave you, those coaches gave you? So, hmm, I would put Bama and Georgia one and two, and then probably Ohio or probably Texas three, Ohio Texas State three. four, and USC fifth. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think people realize how big Ohio State is. Ohio State's Massive. the biggest – it's the biggest university in the country. It's huge. It's them and UCF. Um, UCF is big like that? UCF is huge, dude. They got the space station, bro. Yeah. UCF and – Oh, that correlates hey, to nah, school to be, size. To be 100% honest with you, UCF is the easiest school to get into in Florida. Mm. So that's why. It's very similar to why. Do you know who has the highest enrollment rate? I thought it was Florida A&M. Like, well, I don't know about that. I'm talking about Power 5 schools. Yeah. Um, the easiest school to get into at Georgia, or in the state of Georgia, is Kennesaw State. That's why their enrollment so high. Um, so a little, little inside the, the, hoo, the, the workings there. How would you guys rank them? Same, same, same kind of range? I would drop USC from five and put them And put in, LSU put there. Put LSU there. Just, yeah. be, just because, I mean, you haven't had the resources that these other schools have had for the last 15 years. I mean, I don't think people really understand how much that Pac-12 deal was holding that program back. Yeah. Hmm. So that's, I'd put LSU at five. Yeah, I, I agree like with that. I like it. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I wasn't necessarily shocked. I was kind of enlightened on how much money is actually there in Tuscaloosa. Mm-hmm. You know, when we, when, we did, when we do all these who's got the bags, Alabama's, like, down the list, I feel like, when we talk about some of these schools. Well, it's not only um, who has the bags, who's willing to give up the bags. Correct. Um, and like I said, the state of Alabama cares about football. There's nothing else to do. Dude. There's no pro a, I don't give there's a no piss pro about teams. nothing but the tie. There's no pro teams. Like when when do you like see concert tours and stuff and go like, "Oh, they're going to Alabama." I thought you said there was no pro team. I was like, "No, like there's <laughs> like, what's chicken It's got to nothing do with but it? pro team. Yeah, it's in nothing Alabama. but Yeah, there's me. nothing but pro team out there. But no, like there's there's no professional teams whatsoever. Like it is Alabama football. That's it. Mm. It is Alabama football. Hey, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Do we see another Nick Saban? I think it'd be disrespectful to say that there would be another one, honestly. I don't think with the landscape you're going to come to in college football, it's going to be feasible. One, because you're going to get so many coaches burning out on this job. Like, Nick Saban was in this industry for 35-plus years. Yep. I don't think you see lifers like that anymore just because it's so much more of a taxing job. You've got super conferences now. You've got 12-team playoffs. You've got NIL. You've got coaches and players being strong arm for more mm-hmm. money. So, I mean, the transfer portal. It's just too stressful of a job now for you to last 40 years in it. So I think you have to separate this discussion into two different levels of like quote unquote goat status. Is it longevity or is it like peak, right? Is it tight number of titles or is it longevity? And if you separate into those two different categories, you'll find the guys that actually have an opportunity to run this down, right? One of them obviously is Kirby Smart. And and your 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 idea that hey, college football, I think what you're getting at is it's harder to win a title now. Or there's more things that can go wrong in a year not, on not your way only to win that, a title? Not only that, it's more stressful of a job. Okay. You have to do five times as much as you did in 2006. Correct. So you're, you're, you're talking about the, the dent on longevity that the world of college football has created. What yeah. I'm talking about is the new landscape of college football creating a little bit more difficult path that to too. a national title. That as well. At least for Nick Saban it was. Mm-hmm. Nick Saban won three of his seven national titles in a four-year window. Okay, during the BCS titles. Yep. Okay, and we moved away from that, and he's won two cents. Okay, so or three cents, three cents, three, three cents, two thousand and fourteen. Okay, fifteen, seventeen, twenty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So three cents, two thousand and fourteen, when when uh, the uh, college football playoff came around. So my initial thought was like, oh, no one's gonna win at that rate, except for if Kirby wins another title next year, he's won three out of four in a college football playoff format. So the only person on in the landscape of college football right now that is available that even has a shot, in my opinion, of running down the total like supremacy of titles is Kirby Smart. He's sitting mm-hmm. at two right now, um, has an opportunity and is a favorite to win a third next year. Will he run down seven? I don't know. 
right? If, if you just assume that there's like this void now in college football, that his path has just become easier, which technically it has. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the local hour. Um, you, you do have a path for this guy to run down seven, but that, that means he's going to, at this rate, have to stick around college football for another 12 years, Yeah, 15 at least, years. At least that, yeah. Um, and that, there's obviously on the horizon, it's a possibility. Um, but in terms of titles, he's the only one. He's got to run down five more by the time he ends up uh, retiring from the sport of college football. The other discussion is the total amount of wins, right? 297 is his number, right? The longevity play of, of do you have an opportunity to run that down? Was that fifth all time? Yeah, I was somewhere, somewhere around that to that that point. Um, and the only guys I, I looked up today, do you know? Do you have a guess? Because I had a guess that was actually really, really good. Uh, Mac Brown. That's a great guess. I feel like we did this one time. Um, I think I did guess Mac Brown. Um, yeah. hmm. Mac Brown. Let me let me think of who's another guy. That's the just... Minnesota head coach. No. Dabo. No. No. no not PJ. Dabo is close. He's got like 140. Are you but talking the, about like? I'm talking about career wins. All time. I'm talking about career wins, all time, all time career coaching wins. I got three names. Dude, is it, this is Division One, Actually, so four. Kalen DeVores yeah. or not? Uh uh-uh. uh. Okay. Um. I'm a man. I'm oh, Gundy. oh, Gundy. Mike yes. Gundy was my guess. He's sitting at fourth right now with 166. Okay, Dabo's uh, third with 169. Uh, nice. Do you know who is number one? Give me a hint. I don't know who number one is. Like number one currently active? Me and my family. Oh, really? Yeah. Brian Kelly has 186 career wins. Huh. So Brian Kelly's got an opportunity. You know what yeah. I mean? If he goes uh, 10 wins for the next 10 years, that's another hundo. I said 286. There's an opportunity for, for Brian Kelly to be one of the more all-time winning head football coaches of all time, which is nuts. But if you think about it, Cincinnati, Notre, I mean, he spent like 10 years at Notre Dame. It was a while. Yeah, he yeah, was wasn't there he for a while. He, he was there for a while, minute. too. He was at Cincinnati for a minute. Um, and then before that, I think it was a, a D2 stint up in uh, Northeastern Hemisphere. Um, but, yeah, Brian Kelly got an opportunity. What's next? What's next for Nick Saban? Seems like either, I, I guess, a TV role. It seems like that's kind of what he was grooming himself. I wouldn't even mm. say he was grooming himself. But like That kind of seemed like he was already stepping into that role a little bit. Yeah. Going on the Pat McAfee show. He was on game day. I, he wasn't on game day for the national championship this year because um, I believe he was out of town. But, um, yeah, it seemed like he was kind of already dabbling into that a little bit. Sit on the porch and watch a duck shit in the yard. Ain't no way. Ain't no, no way. No, he'll never do that. No, he'll lose his mind. Um, there are certain folks out there in this world I don't think are ever meant to be sitting still. Yeah. Retirement's uh, not for everybody. I was about to say, you're one of them. <laughs> yeah, myself, <laughs> myself included. I, I am not meant to be sitting still despite how large I am. Um but in terms of what's next, I think well, if you watch that Reese Davis interview, that joker going to work for ESPN so goddamn quick. He's going to be on college game day set so fast. Here's – here's an, and I don't know how this would get a reaction or even if this is a possibility. He's out here strapping headgear on. That's what I was going to say. Is, yeah. he, is, he, is he Corso's replacement? Don't There's do it. No Please don't do it. There's no, no I mean, I, I mean, I think that, that – segment gets killed when Corso yeah. finally leaves that, the dash. Yeah. But just that's one of the major it. reasons why you why it shouldn't happen. But, but then again, like, game day is torched. Here's happens. what they'll do. They'll uh, they'll paint the pick on Pat McAfee's chest and belly, and he'll take his shirt off. And that's how they'll make picks yeah. on game days now. It'll be, uh, it'll be, instead of Corso's headgear, it'll be McAfee's chest hair. All right. So, I like it. There you go. Um, Another thing I, I don't think we've, we've even, like, thought about that's going to be an effect of this is i mean he's pretty much a shoe in now to be the cover of the new video game that and he's also a shoe in to be the college football uh, commissioner and i don't know when it's going to happen but he hinted towards it there was a direct quote in that interview that he had with reese davis and i want to read it to you because i wrote it down um he said there's more to come from my standpoint on that meaning like he was asked about all the changes in college football and he said that he had all these ideas and all these ways to, to handle all the issues right now in college or in college football. And he said their quote will be more from me on that front in the coming future. Um, I thought that was a direct hint at I'm fitting to, I'm, I'm fitting to take over. I'm mm-hmm. fitting to be a college football commissioner and make sure this shit is run right. Well, Which well, honestly, would anybody I would disagree love that. other than I don't even know. Who who dislikes Nick Saban? Auburn. 
Yeah, but that's a fan base. I don't think I don't think there's really anyone in the coaching world that at uh, least doesn't have a yeah. base. I mean, you have to have a baseline of respect for the yeah. guy for what he's done the last 15 isn't that, years. Isn't that crazy? He like I I know of one head football coach that dislikes Kirby Smart, or at least I think dislikes Kirby Smart, and he's in the SEC. We don't have to go anywhere any further, but. I don't think there's a single coach that I can think of off the top of my head that has disdain for Nick Saban. I mean, really, like... And all the ass-beating that that man's been doing. I mean, really nobody. I mean, even outside of the coaching world, like, really nobody, I would say, like, hates Nick Saban. I, I don't even think, like, Georgia fans, I feel like you get the same response yeah. from Georgia fans yeah. every time they're asked about Nick Saban in Alabama. It's, I freaking respect the heck out of dude, but I hate how much he wins. And I hate him for that reason. I hate how much he's broken our hearts or whatever. I feel like that's kind of the consensus opinion on Nick Saban of if you're not an Alabama fan, you don't necessarily hate Nick Saban. You just hate the success that he's had. Yeah. You respect for what he's done to the game. Absolutely. Got to have a tremendous amount of respect. Uh, let's talk about this LSU super staff, quote unquote, that they're putting together. Uh, stole Blake Baker, defense coordinator from Missouri. Also stole Bo Davis, the defensive line coach from Texas, who was an LSU alum. So he's quote unquote going back home, but uh, it's good. It's good that they're going out here and adding a quote unquote super staff. It's good that they got out, they got out here and made some changes and all that stuff. Their their issues defensively last year were in part largely because of schematics. They they just did not have it well put together. A lot of busted assignments. A lot of stuff that didn't make any sense. Right. I've talked about on this network all the time that if I watch you, I want to be able to explain why. All right. I don't need to be able to know what you're doing or or understand fully what you're doing or I don't have to make questions about personnel decisions. But whatever you're doing schematically, if it makes sense to me, if there is a reason why, then we're good. There was a lot of things that LSU did on tape this year that just didn't make no sense. And if that's the case, if there's no why to it, you got to go. And that's exactly what happened this year. Not only take into account that his players obviously revolted from him out there on the defensive side of the football, it seemed as well. So there was a lot going on out there, so it made sense to make these changes. It's great that they made these changes, but it wasn't just a schematic issue. They had a personnel issue last year, particularly in the defensive backfield. Um, they just weren't good enough. They were not good enough in the back end. Um, and despite the fact that they brought in new players, like they tried to address it in the offseason and just couldn't figure it out. I think they took five uh, new players or transfers in the back end last year in the defensive back room. And that's, that's a lot of change for not a lot of different results. Again, could be very large so be in part due, due to schematics. Um, but they stole these football coaches from, you know, members of the conference. And anytime you take good coaches – from member schools of the conference that you're ultimately going to play sometime down the road. That's good news for you normally. All right. Except I would have said the same exact thing last off season when they hired a bunch of dudes from other coaching staffs, right? They stole a defensive line coach from South Carolina and fired his ass within 10 months. Okay. So I'm very optimistic that Blake Baker is a great football coach. I'm very optimistic that Bo Smith is a great football coach. But I was very optimistic in some of the coaching hires that they made uh, last couple off seasons as well. So we'll see. It's a results-based uh, business. They definitely got great names uh, this week, boys. I mean, LSU has a track record of being able to really turn around their program rather quickly. Uh, in 1999, their record was 3-8. and eight. Nick Saban comes in in 2000, and within three years, that guy had a national championship there. Uh, and then they went on in the later 2010s, winning another national title. And then – a few years it took them with Joe Burrow um, to win a national title as well under Ed Orgeron. And then even after the disaster that Ed Orgeron left the program, they were right back in the SEC title game with Brian Kelly in year one. So they have shown the ability to make these quick turnarounds. So maybe they can do that on the defensive side of football this year. Chat being hella active. Hey, we got another hour of local college football talk coming up right now. Welcome to Talk the Dog, the show where we find a bone to pick and a take to give. These are not hot takes. These is dog takes. Can I talk that dog? Shut up and grab some tape. Crown the man. Crown the man. He is the king. He is the king of college football, is Kirby Smart. Um, that dude was already standing on the throne. He was, like, standing next to it, maybe sitting on the arm, like sitting on the arm of the, of the throne. 
and was just waiting for King Saban to just fall off just a little bit. And then it's like, all right, whew, we're nice and comfy here. We got to change some of the decorations in this here King's chamber. But other than that, pretty dope spot. Pretty dope spot as the king of college football. Um, and I was just wondering, like, how much – stronger does the announcement of Nick Saban retiring make the University of Georgia and I saw some statistics rolling around uh, social media about how I think the last active college football coach to beat uh, Kirby Smart is in 2018 and it's South Carolina South Carolina Will Muschamp no that was yeah Will oh, Muschamp that's Will Muschamp yeah, yeah who is the last active football coach to beat him it's Gus Malzahn in 2017 yes it's Gus Malzahn wow. and uh, there's one other Either way, it's been a while. It's been a while since anybody other oh, than Nick it. Saban has beaten that's Kirby Smart, it. huh? That's it. That's it. Like it was, it was Ed Orgeron in 2018. He's gone. 2019, Ed Orgeron. Yeah. Dan Paul Mo Johnson's gone at Tech. Les Miles was there when they. Les no. Miles doesn't have an active head coaching no. job no. right now. 2019, it was Ed Orgeron and um, Will Muschamp. 2020, Nick Saban, Dan Mullen. 2021. Nick Saban, 2022, no one will beat him. 2023, Nick Saban. It's been tw it's been six years yeah. since an active head coach has beaten Kirby Smart. And he's not even at the current school that he beat him at. Yeah. He's down there at UCF. Um, so it's been a while. It's been a while since anybody other than Nick Saban uh, beat this guy uh, in, in a college football playoff or a college football game in general. And I propose the question to you, boys, because um, you are the resident Georgia fans here. I'm just some guy who's paid to talk about him. Um how just how dominant would this Kirby Smart run be if Nick Saban just didn't exist as he doesn't exist now in college football? Uh, I think Georgia would be the king of college football dating all the way back to the start of 2003 if Nick Saban doesn't exist. I mean, it dates all the way back to him being in an LSU. It cost Georgia a 2003 SEC championship game against LSU that year. Was that the uh, Matt Flynn year uh, or was it the Jamarcus Russell year? No, Jermichael Russell was later, I believe. So is the Matt Flynn year? Well, sounds like Matt Flynn year. Right. So 2003 SEC Championship game, 2012 Alabama um, SEC Championship game, which also cost you the national championship of the year. Georgia would have beat you Notre Dame. Skull drug Notre Dame. Absolutely. 2017 national championship. So that's two natties that Georgia would have had since 2000. Um, and then the 2018 SEC Championship game, it cost you. You would have gone into the college football playoff that year. You can make the case on whether or not Georgia would have had a great shot at winning the Natty if they got in the college football playoff. And then really after that, it was just the 2021 SEC Championship that he cost you. So he cost you four SEC titles, and then he also cost you three national championships. Do you count this year's SEC title? No. So five. he cost you five SEC titles. Five SEC titles and, then, and whatever would have happened. I also year. threw this one in there. He cost you Devontae Smith. Oh, that's true. That's and a true. bunch of other recruits. And a bunch of others. But Devontae Smith was recruits. the one that's, that came that's to that's mind. That's the one that hurt you the most, huh? Well, that's just, I mean, heck, <laughs> heck yeah, it hurts yeah. a lot. The fact that he was committed to Georgia knowing what he went and did, yeah, it should hurt. I don't know, man. There's a lot of L's in that in that recruiting battles in the well, last couple of no years. No doubt. That was just one that came to mind. I was like, oh, you know what? Devontae Smith, we'll throw him in there. Yeah, I mean, Devontae Smith might be the biggest loss from a recruiting standpoint for Georgia just because of what he did. Yeah. Won the Heisman, beat you in the natty. Yeah. Oof. So... So there's also like the – you mentioned all the way back to 2003. I was kind of just thinking the Kirby run. But if that were the case, if Nick Saban didn't exist, like does Kirby – I mean, if we're really butterfly and effect in here, does Kirby ever end up at Georgia? Like does Mark Rick so. ever get fired? I don't, I don't think, think so. so. I don't think Mark Rick gets fired in 2015. Or, I mean, he might have, he might have retired, but yeah. – I don't. I don't think so. I mean, we don't even know if Kirby Smart turns into this if Nick Saban isn't around. We don't know what Kirby Smart, the head coach, looks like without him being around Nick Saban for as long as he was. I mean, that had a huge part of the directory in his career and the type of head coach he became, and just being around him. So we don't even know what that looks like for Kirby. Someone needs to do a "It's a Wonderful Life" segment where <laughs> some grumpy college football fan just wishes, "I wish Nick Saban never existed," and then they have to go back and see all the different changes, how how different this sport would be had he not been there. You don't have Jimbo Fisher, you don't have Butch Jones, you don't have Kirby Smart, you don't have Jeremy Pruitt. I mean, the list goes on and on. SEC and on and Shorts needs to get on that right now. Yeah, that's, a, that's a perfect shorts. segment. If you're listening, make a, it's a wonderful life segment about uh, where college football would be if Nick Saban wasn't here. All right, it's time to judge me. Never seen It's a Wonderful Life. I mean, I, I don't feel like that's judge worthy. It's to a be it's a great movie. What's I don't, it about? It's a Christmas movie about basically this banker guy who. Like gets in a, it gets in a rut. The whole premise is he wishes he was never born, and then an angel comes oh. and shows him like how great he's made the world. It's like a he's Christmas here. version of Thirteen Going on Thirty. 
kind of. <laughs> kind of. Boy, oh boy. No, I, I, I chick flick guy, huh? Yeah. Wow. You know, um, you've seen thirteen going on thirty. But well, never I have. Seen a, I have a little life. sister who is six years younger than me, mm-hmm. and uh, we spent a lot of time watching movies. Oh, that good. was our bonding. So Heck yeah. screw you guys, I'm a good brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, nah, welcome into tonight's show. We got a load of local hour for you guys tonight. We're going to talk about who Georgia's biggest threat is remaining in college football. How do you get Kirby to coach until he's 72 years old? Um, how, how? How do you do it? That's what Nick Saban managed to do. Is it possible that Kirby could possibly do that? Um, can they go after the Bama roster? The, the chat is up here talking all kind of stuff about all kind of Alabama football players. We'll address some of that tonight. A.J. Harris has a new home, and yo, Mike White. Mike White finna make me talk hoops, baby. Hey, Mike White, give him three. That boy Mike White got me out here talking hoops on this channel. Can you believe it? it? I like it. I think it's the second time ever talking hoops on this channel. (laughs) The first time, if I remember correctly. I read A blocked hoops last time. And if I remember correctly, it kind of went downhill from there after that. Oh, damn. Maybe we shouldn't talk hoops. No, it's okay. I'm here. All right, bet, bet. Bring we a new spark to it. We're going to let Jay Will talk some hoops tonight. So uh, hang in with us. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, and rate and review. And I also want to give a quick shout out to our friends over at the Athletic Collection. All of the posters that you see hanging around this studio can and will be made available for you over at the Athletic Collection. The link to the description for those posters is in the bio and the description of this video. Um, those are NIL plays, so you will be able to uh, support some local athletes with those purchases of those posters. They're ready to hang right on your wall, man. All it takes is a, a couple tic tac patty wax, uh, and there you go. A dog got a bone on the wall. Um, so how about that? Um, Georgia's biggest threat, boys. Who is it? Who is Georgia's biggest threat in college football now that the GOAT hath retired? This isn't a who, but it's a if or whatever you want to call it, a Carson Beck injury. Mm. That's that's the biggest threat right about now. Immediate threat. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about immediate threat. Like if that happens, uh, expectations go completely out the window, and it's I don't. You're scrambling for answers at that point, in my opinion. Yeah. My turn. Yeah. It's the F word and the C word: fatigue and complacency. Ah. Because Saban's and we, you you just did it. Saban's gone now. Everyone thinks it's Kirby Smart. Hey. He's the king of the world. He's king of college football. It's him and everybody else. Like, we don't even have to try at this point. If you let that seep into your program, you're very quickly going to go back to mediocrity. Obviously, I don't think Kirby Smart's going to let that happen, but having to get up and maintain this high level of success, now that there's not a guy striving for you, not a guy you have to chase, not a guy where you have to say, shit, I mean, we have to beat Nick Saban this year. I mean, there's no one technically breathing down your neck. Look Look what that's done. Complacency never breeds success, so... That's what the biggest threat is now. So you guys went to contributing factors to success, and they're very, very con- like key contributing factors. I have one of those as well. Um, but I have some outside, like, actual things in college football, like the 12-team playoff, creating more opportunities for bad days, right? We talked about bad days. You guys got a little upset at me, okay, because I told you that you lost your playoff game this year, and that's okay. Um, but it's about winning and playing perfect in December, which is what you're going to have to do in years for- moving forward. So showing up and having a bad day at any point in December or January moving forward is going to cost you an opportunity to win a national title. That is definitely on the horizon or definitely a possibility and something that you should be fearful of. Um, Texas. Texas coming into this conference with Sark as the head coach and seemingly stable, right? And you don't mm-hmm. really know what – I mean, if Arch Manning is what they sell him to be, if he is what everyone believed him to be coming out of high school, then that could be a little bit – uh, troublesome for you moving forward. And I've always said it um, just because I, I pay attention to my mentions. And I, I have a I think I have a decent gauge on how you guys feel. Um, the biggest threat, in my opinion, to at least the fan base of, of Georgia football fans, is if Florida's ever good again. Like if Florida's ever worth a shit ever again, it's, it's not going to be a problem, but it's going to be worrisome, right? That's going to be worrisome for you, um, it, at least from a recruiting standpoint, right? It's hard to go into Florida and pull out Florida players when Florida's good, okay? Their five-hour radius covers the state, essentially. It covers North Florida. It covers South Florida, all right? So um, that, that, that's one right there. But the biggest threat to Kirby Smart, or, or Georgia, in my opinion, is college football in general. The, the way that it is situated right now um, – I don't think Kirby Smart has been quiet about his complaints at all, like Mm -hmm. at all. In fact, I think he's been more boisterous about the issues in the world of college football than he has been about any other topic than perhaps moving Florida to a home-and-home, 
Okay, outside of that, the dude does not publicly complain about anything. But he has definitely publicly complained about the way the world of college football currently works. And the morning after he won his first national title, he sat down with Reese Davis and told him, I have a fear that this, this world of college football is going to cost me good coaching and that good coaches are going to leave this sport because they just can't handle the schedule because the schedule's nuts. It's 365 days a year. It's 24-7, okay? So you are constantly, constantly working, and it is lifeless outside of the world of college football. And I just don't believe that anyone – you guys talked about it in the National Hour. I don't think anyone's going to be going out here and, uh, you know, coaching college football for 35 years like Nick Saban. I just don't think it to be the case – uh, moving forward, um, Texas A&M wide receiver Evan Stewart has committed to Oregon. So there you go. Um, but I, I just don't see that if there's no change in the way the lives of college football coaches have been impacted lately, the year, there, there's just no chance, in my opinion, that we see 15 more years of Kirby Smart. I just I think he'll be burnt out. Um, I think he'll be tired um, and, and tired of it. I think he's tired now. I think he's been very mm -hmm. obvious and open about how tired he is right now at 48. Yeah, I mean, we were watching back in the SEC media days. We went back and watched his 2016 press conference. And the first thing I noticed, other than him being, like, extremely nervous, was, God, he looks young. Yeah, like, he's he almost looks, aged like a president. He, he's yes. aged probably 15 years since he's gotten to Georgia, which, I mean, it, it makes sense. Look at what the sport does. It, look what it demands of you. So. And I think we don't notice it as much with Saban. It's because he took the job at, like, 52, and he was, he was kind of already, mm -hmm. I'm not going to say old, but he was, he was not young. You know it I mean? showed this year, though. I, I Look, I said it th earlier yeah, in the did. season. Like, he looks tired. I think he's done. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, great take by me. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> I sat down on the show notes today. I said, God dang it. Kirby's going to circle back the wagons on him being right after watching the best coaching the best coaching season of oh, yeah. Nick Saban's career. You're going to come back and say, I knew it. I knew I was right to throw dirt on the grave. That's mm -hmm. funny. Um, no, you weren't. <laughs> I want, no, look, look, what he did was incredible, and, and yeah. I think I think it was his best coaching performance of his tenure at Alabama. But the writing was on the wall. I said he looks like a satisfied coach. He has one foot in retirement, and he did. Chat's asking about which coach is it. I mean, come on, guys. Like we Just know. do some thinking. I mean, like we on, know. Guys. Just do some thinking. I think honestly, um, I'll put I'll put it this way: There's only been one coach in the last eight years that's left the University of Georgia for a lateral position. I wonder why. Go ahead. I think that maybe even – I think Nick Saban could be a reason why Kirby Smart sticks around in the game longer. I think there are multiple reasons why um, Georgia fans should actually be grateful for Nick Saban, even though he didn't coach at their program or do anything for them. I think he did do some things for them. Like, I think that Nick Saban was a massive reason why the 2021 National Championship was so special. That Now, ending a 40-plus year drought would have been special regardless of who you beat, regardless of how that drought ended. But because of what everything that happened prior to that, obviously it created like this ultimate climax of mm. what happened in that moment. And I think that they're obviously for Kirby Smart in general, but I think because of what he did during his time as a head coach, I think that also kind of creates this underlying everlasting motivation for Kirby as well. Whether he would admit that or not, I feel like it does create some type of goal to continuously like chase after, regardless of what's happening, regardless of how much success you've had. I think it creates like motivation that's never ending. Um, if his life or if his coaching career was a life and it had a lifespan, I think last January and all the shit that continued to be carried on with that story all the way into July probably didn't help. No, not at all. Um, yeah. Even though, I mean, they, the school was so rightfully pissed off about all that, that they, I mean, they took action for the first time I've ever seen in, in, in regards to correcting a news article and correcting quote unquote investigative journalism that obviously was very, very slanted. Um, but now I see some people in the chat talking about how, um, you know, they probably shouldn't make him do all the, the midweek interviews and, and do all that stuff. I'm, I'm here to tell you right now, Kirby Smart has the least amount of media obligations of any college football coach in America. Okay. He does less than anybody else. All right. So if there's any, Hey, let's eliminate the Tuesday press conference. I think he has to do those, by the way. I think he's contractually obligated to do it a certain amount of time every week for, uh, for communications purposes for the conference. So um, there are certain things that he has to do, one of which being uh, in front of the media. What would help his lifespan is to not have to 
just suck up to every player on his roster for 365 days a year. If you actually allowed this guy to coach because you put some parameters around when kids can leave, when kids can come, whether or not they're obligated to continue to play for you and honor their contract, if those things happen, I think he gets back to loving coaching again. And I'm not saying he doesn't love the shit right now, but he damn sure don't look like he likes it if you watch him. If you pay attention to him, if you listen to him, um, it doesn't sound like he loves the way the world uh, is right now in college football. But the question now becomes is, is like, if you are trying to prolong this career, if you are the University of Georgia, if you are someone in our position right here, how would you go about prolonging the career of, of, of Kirby Smart? I'm not saying he's going to coach till he's 72 years old like Nick Saban did, but what if he wanted to? How would you get him to that point? Oh, uh, you give him a clone. You give him a clone? That's the only option. You give him, you a, give him a clone yeah. or forty million dollars a year. Yeah, a pill that makes you never fatigued or never the tired, and, pill. and only let Kirby Smart take Hell it. Yeah. But I mean, other than that, I, I don't see an avenue to where just 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 looking down the road, the changes that have gone in college football the last three seasons. How ten years from now, you're not going to say this isn't going to be a completely different sport again. So I mean, I, I can't imagine Kirby Smart enjoys having to constantly evolve the way that in, in unprecedented ways. So. Yeah. I don't think there is really something you can do to make him stick around. Yeah, give him less media have availabilities, give him more money, but, I mean, that only goes so far. I got a wicked hot take coming up here in a second. I think that it's success, obviously, would keep him around mm. longer. I don't care who you are. If you're continuing to succeed at something and you're continuing to do well, you're going to want to stick around. I mean, Tom Brady retired, then unretired, because he's like, well, shoot, I won a freaking Super Bowl. I'm still winning, so why shouldn't I go back and play? I, th I mean, athletes possess this, and especially coaches. Like, if you're continuing to win, that's definitely going to make you want to stick around a little bit longer. And I think also there also has to be – like I kind of mentioned earlier, like competitiveness. Like if he, but I think success could also make it easier for him to leave and easier for him to step down at an earlier stage because if it gets to a point where it's like, well, dang, I got all these natties now. I don't need to keep coaching anymore. I think there has to be this competitive drive for him because we know Kirby Smart is a highly competitive person and that has to stick around for him to want to keep doing this. So here's my theory. Okay. Let's hear it. Is this tinfoil hat worthy or this just? Nah, dude, I, I think this is gas. Mm -hmm. I think it's a straight gas theory right here. You ready? All right. Um, Andrew Smart's in like seventh grade. Mm -hmm. About that, yeah. About, yeah. So he's got about like five years left of, of preparatory school before he's a college football player, if he wants to do that. Correct. About that. And Kirby's been very forthcoming about how that Andrew wants to play football. Andrew is playing football. The only one of his two sons that is. The other one's disinterested in really any attention or any football at all. Um Y'all haven't been on the recruiting circuit like I have, but Division One players, you know, kind of like, like 13, 12, 13 years old, mm -hmm. like whether or not they're going to be that. Um, mm -hmm. Now, there, there are some differences, right? There are some, some anomalies to this kind of statement. There are some guys that pop when they're 15, 16 years old and become first-round uh, type players and five-stars or whatever. But for the most part, by the time you're 12 or 13, I, I can kind of look at you and tell whether or not you're going to be like what you're going to be. Andrew Smart has got PWO written all over him. Oh, yeah. Andrew Smart has preferred walk-on at the University of Georgia written all over him if he wants that, okay? So what if that's what he wants, you know? What, what if I want to play for dad, all right? So if I want to play for dad, that automatically buys Georgia fans five years, immediately. Automatically buys you four years. And then guess what, or five years, guess what it also buys you? It buys you his time during a, as a football player, right? At the University of Georgia, it buys you another four. So we could get you to nine right now immediately, if Andrew Smart wants to come be a, a Georgia Bulldog. that That's my oh, – oh, and then guess what? Hey, we're a walk-on, Brooksy. We're a PWO. The the college the, – the the playing career, not very lengthy. All right, but I'm I'm Drew Smart now. I'm no, I'm no longer Andrew. I've dropped the and. I'm just Drew. Drew Smart wants to be a college football coach. Drew Smart going to be around being a GA at UGA. So now we've extended this nine-year lifespan into a 13-year lifespan. All right? Now we got Kirby Smart on into the 2040s. How about them apples? What y'all wow. think? 40s. 20, uh, tw mid 2030s. I love how you just laid out a 13 year old's next 15 years <laughs> of his life. But no, I mean that. No Strabesis right here. Y'all heard it here first. Yeah, January I mean, 11th. That that is something that I think would be an incentive for Kirby to stay, other than winning and loads of money, is being able to actually coach your son. Because I mean, like. Obviously, you can't do that now. You can't do little league stuff. I don't even know if he gets to watch his games. But being able to say, hey, I coached my son at the University of Georgia, that's, mm. that's pretty sick.
Mm. So that that might that might be. Something. And look, this family is not opposed to their sons playing for their father. Kirby played for his dad. Mm. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. There's both. There was two sons on the roster last year that were playing for their dads as well. Facts. So there's Facts. that too as well. What position would Andrew Smart play? He's a receiver, or he wants to be at least. Yeah. I mean, in pregame warmups, he wants to be. Um, that dude got him a, a Florida State football. Did you see that? Oh, yeah. I sent uh, you guys that photo. Of course he did. Um, dude also has an affinity for the camera. As soon as he, That's why he's also a receiver. He's not going to play anything else. He's got an affinity for the camera. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think the, the Andrew Smart walk on to GA route gets you at least 14 more years of Kirby Smart. Hmm. And, then, and you got to remember, he's going to drop the and. It's going to be Drew Smart. When this take lands in like 10 years. Too, bro? What the? bro, it's just going to be Drew. I mean, once you once you put away your childish things, Andrew's become Drew's. We know this. You don't think he just stays huh? boogie? Coach Boog? Coach Boog? Coach Boog? Coach Boog is I – would, I would go with Coach Boog before – like, what's wrong with Andrew? Grows a mullet. <laughs> Why are you like hating on the looks like, looks like Belichick's son on the sideline. <laughs> That'd be disgusting. Actually. I'm just saying, bro, if your name is Andrew, just – Try Drew out for a little bit, you know? See what happens for you. Mm. I don't like it. I, I think can. it's convenient for everybody else. <clears throat> I, think, I think that's the one, it. The one syllable, one the syllable. two letters. I mean, all, all great nicknames are one-syllable nicknames. I think, that's an, nicknames. I think that's an interesting theory, though, because honestly – The I, film guy? That's, a, that's a, a, a pseudonym, not a nickname. I think it's interesting <laughs> because – I think honestly, his children have kind of been something that we felt like maybe would take him away from the game, not yeah. keep him around. Mm. So I think it is enticing, and at least it's entertaining to think about that maybe his child is the key to keeping him in the game longer, keeping him in Athens longer. All right, all cockamamie theories aside, all Drew Smart related theories aside, um, here's the here's the the point that I really want to hammer home with Georgia fans listening tonight is the fact that Nick Saban coached at Alabama for 17 seasons. Okay, that, that is what we just watched. 17 seasons, uh, one at a rate that has never been seen before, 87.7% uh, clip, I believe. Kirby's at about 86% right now. Okay, so you're on the track to do those things. You're winning national titles at a similar rate that that guy did at Alabama. But here's the thing that you should know. You're eight years into a 17-year run. Mm -hmm. If it's only 17 years, you're almost halfway through it, Okay. Um, and more who's than to say, say what more than halfway going through. into nine, aren't you? Yeah. Going into nine. So you're right now you are halfway no, you're through. Going in, I'm tripping. You're going right in. now you are halfway through eight and a half years into a 17 year run of Nick Saban. Kirby Smart's halfway through that. You're 50% through what that guy put down in Tuscaloosa. So well, I don't know how you want to ingest that. I would ingest that with knowing that maybe you're closer to the end of this run than you were to the beginning of this run. Or maybe he coaches until he's 70. I don't know. But I, I just think that no, n nothing of the world of college football right now tells me anybody's coaching until they're 70. They're all croak um, is what I kind of think about all that. Croak or quit. And I, I think something that Georgia fans don't really aren't really aware of is how quickly this regime is going to be over. Not in the fact that it's going to end soon or we're in the, the latter years of it, but I don't think you're right. I don't think we're going to do the five years of is he going to retire? Like no, I think it's I think you're going to wake up one day and he's going to be like, all right, hey, look, I'm done, guys. I've done, I've done everything I could, and it'll come out of nowhere. Yeah, but but I mean, like you're the, you're at the equivalent of where Nick Saban was in 2015 right now, mm. which doesn't feel that long ago if we're being honest. So like, imagine how quickly these next few years are going to go. You're probably going to win more national titles as well. So it's it's gonna go quick. Just just be ready to what what would be the uh, little Debbie's oatmeal cream pie equivalent for Kirby Smart? Uh, I've heard he likes Longhorns T-bone steaks. I, right, heard he's, I heard he's a big steak and potato guy. Get ready to slap a Longhorns T-bone steak at wherever they build the statue. Yeah, but I, yeah, he definitely doesn't have the oatmeal cream pie thing going on. No, but yeah, my my sources tell me he big big red meat eater, which checks out. I mean, red Checks meat's out. pretty good. Have you heard it the is. nervous bird story about Jim Harbaugh? Yeah, I heard it today. Actually. Yeah, no, he doesn't eat chicken because it's a nervous bird, and he thinks it creates uh, nervous inhibitions in the people who eat it. You got nervous inhibitions? I don't think I do. I don't know, man. You be eating a lot of chicken. I do love chicken. Man's like, can I borrow your microwave? <laughs> <laughs> Bro, cold chicken's not very good. You're right. 
but traveling with chicken also very weird. Mm. Just traveling with a box of chicken. Look, man, we run a tight schedule around. Hey, got to do what you got to do. I'm with you on that one. Um, but no, I think the the biggest takeaway when looking at these. Uh, kind of comparisons between the two is just how much of an earlier start Kirby got mm -hmm. um, in comparisons to Saban. Saban spent some time in the NFL before he even took the Michigan State job. Yeah, uh, and to counter that, though, Nick Saban had a lot more experience to go off of before mm -hmm. he got to Alabama. It wasn't his first head coaching gig. It was multiple head coaching gigs, a stop in the NFL, and then Alabama. Yeah, and I mean, he absorbed so much more knowledge from that, obviously, too, just because you had the opportunity to work with a multitude of coaches – at a multitude of levels of football. So I think the advantage honestly goes to say everyone looks at Kirby's like, hey, he's young. Imagine if Kirby does this for 20 more years. I don't think he's going to. Yeah. I, I think one thing we did learn from this experience and the last couple of big jobs that have come open, um, if Kirby Smart's coaching college football, it ain't nowhere but the University of Georgia. Yeah. I mean, no, that that's yeah. – solidified i don't think he's going anywhere the the amount of energy and, and will it takes to go into a school make connections with boosters build a coaching staff build a roster win football games why would you leave where you're at right now where you have all those things and you're doing at a national title rate that's why the argument to, for kirby to bama is so idiotic to me because why would kirby leave a place he has everything he's ever going to want that Bama could offer. If Kirby goes anywhere, it's his ego telling him that he can make it work in the NFL. Um, or and I don't mean that derogatorily. Mil. Like I think every college football, every football coach in the world thinks that they can do it, right? That they can coach football better. Oh, I'll fix it. I'm 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 the key, right? Get me in there. Um, but I also don't think there's anything about him that strikes me as an NFL guy. No, it's too much of a micromanager. Yeah. Very much so. Um, and it's just a – I don't think he – I don't think he would do well with a star wide receiver sitting out of practice because, mm -mm. fuck it, it's Tuesday. <laughs> like, we're just going to do – we're going to do that all year, bro? Like, what the hell yeah. is this? I'm not – I'm not handling no. that. <laughs> I, I think there are – there's definitely certain coaches that are more fit for the NFL – Bill yeah. Belichick. And, and they typically reek of it. They yeah. Like, guys yeah. that w can need to go to the NFL, it's like, dude, just go ahead and go. Like, we yeah. know it. Like, everybody already gets the feeling about Lincoln Riley. Everybody has yeah. the same feeling about Lincoln Riley of, like, just go ahead and go to the NFL. Mm -hmm. There's other coaches, you're like, yeah, you're meant for college football. Kalen DeBoer strikes me as an NFL guy. I could see it. I could see that, yeah. Just no, no nonsense, doesn't really care about the – like, here's how I know college coaches love the shit that they do. All the all the giddy ones, all the all the super good recruiters. If you notice, they end every. I don't know which coach started this. Go dogs, or uh, you know whatever uh, roll tide, or whatever their their moniker is at the end. I think it was Orgeron. Was it Orgeron? I, I think Orgeron made. Oh, it, I think Orgeron made it famous. That was a decent, decent. Not, not bad. Not Go Tigers. That's that's better. Mm, that's pretty good. Go Tigers. Now do Larry Munson. Yeah. Nah, no, don't, don't do that. That. We're <laughs> passing on Larry Munson. Um, one of my favorite questions I've ever asked at a conference was to Ed Orgeron. I asked him what it's like to uh, recruit for your home state. Hey, you know, I, I get to I get to give me some good po' boy. That was his favorite part. He gets to eat good po' boy. Gumbo. Good gumbo. Mm -hmm. um, don't know where we were, but where were we? Talking about Kirby Smart and NFL coaching. Yeah, the, the, you the, the were talking about DeBoer, actually. Yeah, I think I think DeBoer strikes me as a, a, a monotoned – a uh, robot that would work out really, really well. Yeah, dude didn't Those even. Those interviews are crazy, aren't they? Dude didn't even crack a smile after getting after winning the cultural playoff semifinal game. It was just like, yep, got another one going. Glad we could get the win today. Job wasn't finished. We'll see y'all in a week. <laughs> Job was not finished. Job no. was got finished, finished was quickly. Not. Um, all right, let's talk about this Bama roster, okay? And there is a thirty-day. I, I keep the moratorium is the word this week. I keep using that moratorium word. There is a thirty-day window now for Alabama's roster and Alabama's football players to insert or enter the NCAA transfer portal if they choose to do so. And I believe interconference uh, issues are waived because of this as well. So there's no inter SEC transfer ban. They can go wherever essentially that they want for a 30 day window if they so choose to get into the portal. Now, um, facts in the chat. Aaron Murray, the chuchless Aaron Murray, ducked me. He did not want any of the smoke. The chat is on that right there. Um, chuchless Aaron Murray, you can get in anytime you want, okay? We, we can get on the football field. We can sling some pill, 
and we'll let you know about that 2% chooch. If you want it, come get it. We already uh, This time, bro, I brought the smoke to Aaron, and he passed up on it. So this time, he's going to have to come to me if he wants that. So uh, we're, we're going to see about that eventually. But nonetheless, uh, let's talk about this Alabama roster. 30-day window can go in, go out. The two names, very obvious, out and up front, Justin Haynes, Caleb Downs, Brooks, you can't get them. Let's talk about good news first. Good news, um, you were very close on Justice Haynes out of high school. I think it was like very, like narrowly thin. I think it was you and I think it was Georgia or Alabama, right? I think it was those two schools. Um, and I think the ultimate reasoning that he chose Alabama was to potentially maybe get out of dad's shadow. All right, I think that, that would play a subliminal role in the whole decision. Okay, on top of that, maybe some playing time, whatever. Maybe just like Nick Saban, Did I'm the- sure. Huh? Is it true that the baseball program had an effect on that as well? Or? I, I, I think all the baseball stuff's fugazi. I think all the two sports shit is bullshit. I think it's all bullshit. I think it's all like, did Kool Aid McKinstry ever play a freaking minute of basketball? No. Did Terry and Arnold ever play a minute of basketball? No. Um, has, you know, like at Georgia, yeah, uh, Arian Smith got to run track, but we saw what that did to his playing time snaps the first two years he was running track, right? Like, I think it's the idea that you're going to play two sports in college is fugazi unless you're a pitcher. If you're just a guy who can go out and throw 95 off the James bump. James Winston. Yeah, if you're Jameis Winston. If you can go out, no warm-ups, no nothing. I have a Jameis Winston story. Jameis Winston played a buddy of mine in high school. They traveled over from Alabama to play him in baseball. Jameis Winston, the school's bus, shows up like, I don't know, two hours before the game. He sits in the back of the bus the whole time doing whatever he's doing. Comes off the bus, does some, uh, some band work, stretches his arm out, gets on the mound, first ball, 96. whoop Okay, so like – if you can do that, you can play baseball and football, but or you can play whatever and football. But if you can't do that, you're probably not playing both. And no, I I, I think it was probably maybe I no I don't think it okay. was a role. Um, by the way, Alabama's baseball program may be like the difference. Maybe they're Mississippi State and Georgia's Vandy. You know what I mean? Like in terms, <laughs> of, they're not they're not good baseball programs. They're not right. elite baseball programs. They're mediocre. Uh, baseball programs as is. So I, I don't know if it was that much of a role. Um, but good news, I think both of the players listen. I think you become an immediate, like, leading candidate for Justice Haynes if he hits the portal. I think that, that that's that. We can leave that at that discussion. Um, I don't want to get too far into it. I think there are ties there, and you guys know what they are. Um, as for downs, I'll be honest. I, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't know about this one. I don't know very much. Um, about the the recruitment process, even from the jump, because it was very, very tightly ran, right? It was very, very much so ran like a professional organization trying to get in close with an NFL guy in the midst of free agency. That's what it felt like. Um, But what I do know is it will be a football-based decision. Every single thing about this kid is 100% football. So if you can pique his interest from an X's and O's or a football standpoint, you probably have a better chance of landing Caleb Downs. and I also know that Notre Dame and Ohio State and Georgia, they were all in the mix coming out of high school. But to me, man, like, and I know the culture is going to change with whoever they choose to hire at Alabama. But the first day I ever saw Caleb Downs, I told him, you're going to Alabama. And he looked at me, he's like, why does everybody say that? Because I was not the first person who had told him that. Why does everybody say that? And I said, dude, because you reek, you reek of Alabama. You reek of Alabama football. And what does an Alabama football player look like? Um, It looks like someone who don't care about nothing but football. Like zero. Like all I want to do is practice, get better. I don't care about partying. I don't care how good the downtown scene looks like. I don't care what your NIL package looks like. I don't care what your Fortune 500 connections look like. I don't really even care about what your academic processes look like, except for do you have a good degree and can I do well at your school? Like, It was nothing but football for this kid. It will be nothing but football moving forward. And it smelt. It always smelt like Bama. And now I don't know. Now I don't know what is what is the like Georgia is the closest thing to Alabama. But I don't know. This kid the kid only needs 18 more months of college football. And then he's a first round draft pick anyway. So I I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think based off the things that I've been told, I wouldn't say Georgia's a favorite if he enters the portal in the first place. Um, but then again, I wouldn't count Kirby Smart out on any safety recruitment. I think what you're about to learn with all of this is how many players truly came to Alabama because Nick Saban was there. <laughs> we finna find because out. Because if you take Nick Saban out of the equation, what's keeping you at Alabama? Is it the culture? Is it the fact that you just love the school? Or is it something else? Because if it was Nick Saban, I can't imagine why you'd stick around. Yeah. I think 
So how do you think this whole thing went down with the recruits and the current players? Like, the current players, obviously, they got a meeting. They told you what the deal was. Like, you have – like, give it some time before you just go mm. ahead and enter the portal, but you have 30 days. But, like, this class, this recruiting class that they just signed, how, how do you think that went down? Because to me, I don't see it as, like – Nick Saban was lying to them the whole time or anything like that and led them astray and then was like, oh, psych, I'm not going to be your head coach. I'm dipping. So I, it almost kind of did seem like that. And I, I don't think there's any right way to do this. There's no right way to retire. There's no right time to retire. He said that in his interview today with Reese Davis. Um, but, I, I mean, dude, he was interviewing potential wide receiver candidate coaches, can, coaching candidates at 355. Yeah. He was on Zoom with potential candidates. At 3.55, he told his football team he was retiring at 4 o'clock. Man, he must have and, felt shitty after that interview. And I'm, it was it was weird because, like, he was asked, like, what was going on in those last minutes. And he was on the phone with Miss Terry. Yeah. And they were they were deciding up until the last minute what it's going to be. And his whole, fin- his whole reason being was because he was having to go to kids' rooms. Or ki- kids' rooms. I always do. They always make that weird. At least you didn't say bedrooms this time. I do it every time I make it weird. That would have been bad. He had to go sit in the kids' homes and tell their parents that he was, you know, they were making him guarantee you're going to be here for the next three or five years. And he said that that promise was getting harder and harder to make. Um, and I'm sure that last class was the last one he ever wanted to make that promise to because he maybe he knew he wasn't going to be able to do it. Um, but, yeah, I, th- I think it, it, it certainly it – was, it was spur of the moment, but it was something that they had thought about. You yeah. know what I mean? I mean, he did. He did, he said in the interview. He he said up five minutes up until I was supposed to go meet with the team. I still didn't know what my answer was. Like I was debating both decisions. I was debating which message I was going to take to yeah. the team five minutes before he's supposed to go. And there. he said, Miss Terry gave him the the you know maybe we come back for one more type deal. And Saban said, as as soon as that is in your mind, maybe. you might as well go. Like yeah. it's inevitable. If it's a maybe. Yeah. No. If it's this is the last one. Mm-hmm. This is a plus one. Well, maybe we do it one more time. Well, if you're only going to do it one more time, you're already going to receive all the, the, the downfalls of people knowing that you're leaving. Yeah. Um, and he so doesn't strike me as someone who wants to go on a farewell tour. No. Mm-hmm. And I, there was also a bunch of things about how, oh, surely he left them some type of uh, contingency plan or some type of plan for his, uh, you know, the person coming up next. Obviously not. No. Obviously not. Like, this was very, hey, I'm, I'm out. You know, and I'm not saying he needed to do all of the protecting of Alabama. In fact, if I were the greatest of all time and I were walking away, my self selfishness and pity would probably say, hey, if it don't work, probably prove that I was as good as I was. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, That would be very selfish of me. But, hey, (laughs) sorry, (laughs) sorry, Um, dog eat dog world. But no, I think those are the two names, and I, I like I said, if if Justice Haynes hits the portal, I definitely think you have an opportunity uh, to land that one. Caleb is going to be tough. Caleb was tough coming out of high school. In fact, at the last minute, I felt like Notre Dame had more leverage and more moment, not leverage, but more momentum towards the the the, the finality of that one than than Georgia did. It was it was wild. It was very very hard to get in on that one. Hmm. Um, boys, I have to use the bathroom, so okay. go ahead, talk it up. <clears throat> So it's a really tough thing that I do to y'all when I do this to you because I know you're not prepared. So let's we'll see how good you are at ad libbing. Well, we, what we need to start doing is just creating pre-recorded segments for Brooks to take a potty break to be like, and now here's this, Brooks reading mean tweets or something like that. So actually, now that he's in the bathroom, go DM him on Instagram and talk shit to him. <laughs> Try your best to hurt his feelings, and then maybe we'll get red on air. Everybody DM Brooks that he does not have a two percent chooch. Yeah, do it right now. That's that. Everybody go to the DMs and flood them. Just, just flood non two percent. Flood his Instagram DMs talking shit about him. All right, he's coming back. So yeah, I it's think really Nick Saban definitely just had a great impact on college football. Was just I hate to see him go. Honestly, it was like yeah. super bittersweet. Um, yeah, just yeah. Kinda. Even even I said like it, it's such a weird feeling because Nick Saban to me now is like a symbol of the era of college football that I fell in love with the sport. Mm-hmm. And like you're gonna, next year, you're gonna have. Oklahoma and Texas in the SEC. You're going to have 12-team playoffs. You're going to have NIL and transfer portals more prevalent than ever. Nick Saban's not going to be there. Like It's going to feel like a very different college football mm. than we're used to. And I don't think people realize that just yet. You know what really scares me when I do that? I can't hear you all. When I walk around the corner, I can't hear you. Mm. So, never well, know It was, it was good content. Never know if you're shit-talking. I, mean, no. I think it was good. I don't think. Um, A.J. Harris? 
Yeah, it was, that, I thought that, I State? actually wanted to bring it up because when I was um, I don't know why I was looking him up, but I looked up AJ Harris the other day, and when I was on his profile, all of a sudden it was like Penn State was the school that was heavily favored for him, and Auburn was the school right behind them. But out of the gate, it was like, oh, that kid's going to Auburn. It seems like, and now he's and at Phoenix Penn State. City ties and all that. Yeah. stuff. Yeah, um, maybe that was a case where he didn't want to go back close to home. I know for me, if I were a five star, um, and I was getting liquid assets all the time. The last place I'd want to be is near home. Mm. Uh, too many people asking. Mm-hmm. Way too many people asking. Let me get a dollar, man. Huh? Let me get a dollar. Let me get a dollar. Just let me hold man. it, man. Let me hold a dollar, man. Um, yeah. So that that would be uh, my first. <laughs> what? You didn't wash your hands. MK Canty. The answer is no. <laughs> hey, look. In the famous words of Will Smith, my dick clean. Um, <laughs> That's a Burt Kreischer joke. My bad. Oh, um, man. Working blue tonight. Man, Jamie's going to be so mad. Jamie's going to text me and say that was a bad, bad movie. <laughs> There's kids that watch this show, man. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Um, but anyways, A.J. Harris to Penn State was a little bit surprising to me. Yeah. Um, as was the Jalen Kimbra. This is his third school? No, fourth this school. Is second school. AJ Harris is second school. Jalen Kim- Kimber, Kimber's, Kimber's third school. Yeah, Jalen okay. Kimber's third school. Georgia, Florida, Penn State. Hmm. How much momentum does this give James Franklin heading into the 2024 season? Because I mean, you have to kind of wonder: is he swirling the hot seat at this point? Uh, yeah, for sure. Or at least uh, the 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 pressure pad. Definitely oh. the pressure pad. Do you think that's why maybe his name got slipped into the candidacy list? Funny. He didn't get slipped. It got edited in, dude. Yeah. Did y'all see that? Yes. Yeah. That Pete. I don't know if the chat did, but Pete Thamel tweeted out a list of uh, of candidates and their buyouts yesterday and then had to go back and edit it and put uh, James Franklin's buyout in there, too. So, a little, uh, little classic case of, hey, don't forget about me. <laughs> you know? I'm still around, man. You know, still what, here. you know what the weirdest thing is? All the odds books I've seen, Glenn Schumann is nowhere on this list. Yeah. It's it's almost like Alabama's not going after this. And it, it kind of felt like he was the shoe-in guy for that. I mean, he's the he's the high-profile so DC. It, it was funny because I think like one of the first lists I saw, he was like fourth best odds to get the job. Like He was on, on the list. And then all the other ones after that, I've seen all the updated lists and everything, he's nowhere mentioned. Like Urban Myers is mentioned before Glenn Schumann is. Huh. Maybe they had a no no uh, coordinator's role or rule. Oh, maybe. You know, or maybe he immediately said no. Maybe. I don't know. But, you know, I don't think you're safe yet in terms no, of – No, absolutely not. No. I mean, no. Glenn Schumann – I mean, the NFL talks, of course, went into February of last year mm. in regards to Todd Munkin. That's when it was – I think it was February 14th. That's when it was announced that he was going to be um, with the Ravens. And then Glenn Schumann officially shut down rumors of him going to the Eagles, I think, on the 17th. So you still got a, a month plus uh, of c- coaching talks of potential people leaving. So I, I got a question then. Yeah. Let's play disaster scenario. Let's play wake up tomorrow and Alabama goes, we're going to pay Kirby Smart $20 million. He's coming to Tuscaloosa. Do you automatic like who's who's your can if you're Georgia? Do you just go with Glenn Schumann or is it someone else? Yeah, I, maybe maybe you promote in house. I mean, obviously, like I, obviously, that's not even crossed anyone in the Georgia I spaces no mind. Clue. We'd find out how good Josh Brooks is at his job. We find out, yeah, real quick. I think we maybe would find out how much Dan Lanning meant what he said to his team. Oh yeah, just saying that would be crazy for Dan Lanning to go on Twitter and be like, "I'm not leaving. Screw y'all, middle fingers, Bama. I mean, I'm Georgia. staying. Look, <laughs> I'm look, going to Georgia. We say that Georgia is arguably the best job in America. You're telling me that that does like I'm. I'm just saying, like I don't care if you tell your team you're staying or not. If a job like that opens, I mean, I mean, the incentive also is you won't have you don't have to live into a, a shadow of Nick Saban. I mean, there's a ninety percent chance that no, you can be a great coach, you can be a top five coach in college football for ten years, and you'll still be the third best Alabama coach of all time. Yeah, like that. Like you, you won't be able to leave behind a legacy like you will at an Oregon or even at this point of Georgia. I mean, Kirby Smart is the greatest Georgia coach of all time. You know what this year is like, or this time of the year brings us every year. The people out on here checking flight logs. Oh, the the beautiful. private jet, the PJ tracking right about now is nuts. Um, like somebody, <laughs> I, I think there's been PJs. What? I I just could have made a joke and I wasn't gonna. <laughs> PJ's going from Tuscaloosa to Athens and back, and people are like, oh, it's Kirby. Or, oh, it's Schumann. Maybe. 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 I don't know. Um, maybe they just did the interview on Zoom 
You ever think about that? Yeah. And, you know, COVID taught us one thing: you ain't got to go to be in person for those types of things anymore. I don't think I don't think Kirby's done an in person interview on any of the recent position coaching hires he's made. Hmm. Like Stacy Searles showed in that in the announcement to, video that they had of him was him dapping like dapping up the coaching staff in the office when he first got to campus with a damn bag on his shoulder. Like most of these are probably done in like do you think uh our man Dante Williams, do you think Dante Williams flew all the way from LA to to Athens to interview for that probably job? Probably not. Most likely probably no. not. Okay, so the idea that you have to be in town or by the way, no one's got to go. None of these coaches have to go. Jimmy Sexton's in Tuscaloosa right now. There's been videos of him going in and out of the building this week, today, yesterday, tomorrow. Okay, so most of the representation and most of the uh, discussions are being done right now um, by the rest of uh, the representations, not even these coaches. Yeah, it's, it's funny to think about how it's like, oh, the plane that's flying to Tuscaloosa had Curry Smart. He, and this is all hypothetical, he met with the Alabama staff and then he flew back to Georgia and now he's the coach. It's not going to happen. They're going to send a representation. They're going to do Zoom, like you said. So, Don't you think it would behoove Bama to already have thrown the book at Kirby? And here's why. If you're, you know, Byrne, I think is his name. If you're Byrne, the athletic director at Alabama, you call Kirby Smart or you call Jimmy Sexton and you tell him you got $20 million a year right now on the table. And what do you think Georgia has to do then? Do you think Kirby strong arms him and makes him give him a raise? I, I, if I'm Georgia, I'm calling the bluff. You think so? Yeah, like I, I would say, like, are, are, do you really think they're going to do that, or is this just something to, to screw us? Because I mean, it's a ninety million dollar buyout. Like people forget about, like, you're going to fork over what a two hundred million dollar contract on top of a ninety million dollar buyout just to get him in the door. I, I don't, I don't. I mean, I know Alabama's got money. I know they haven't had to pay buyouts at all in the last twenty years, but yeah. I can't see them coming together with that type of cash, mm. especially when you can go out and hypothetically get a guy like Dan Lanning or Lane Kiffin or Mike Norvell for a much cheaper and more likely price. So there's some comments about Kirby's buyout in the chat. Uh, I unfortunately was mistaken on a tweet today, uh, tweeted out about his, how his buyout is $90 million. There's two buyouts. There's the buyout if he leaves, there's a the buyout if he's fired. The buyout if he's fired is $90 million. Uh, he basically has to pay $5 million if he wants out of his contract till 2034. So he can get out whenever he wants mm. for $5 million. $5 million ain't nothing. I've heard Dan Landings is substantially higher. I've heard Landings is $20 million on paper, but there's some stipulations in his contract that they put in that almost nearly doubles what is available there. Mm. So I think that was also part of the, the reason Landings said no, because <laughs> the buyout was going to be ridiculous. Jeez. So, um, yeah, I think right now you, you circle and pin Caleb DeBoer, and then after that you look at Mike Norvell. I think those are going to be the two options. What about an there. NFL guy? Like, you know, like, like, like Mike Vrabel, Vrabel's getting thrown Vrabel around. Vrabel is obviously available. Vrabel recently fired from Tennessee, but it wasn't from performance basis. He basically got into an argument with the general manager and wanted his job. So he he required or demanded that he get roster control, and they said, well, you can get out of here. I think I mean, he still has nightmares about A.J. Brown getting traded. <laughs> Have you seen the video yeah, of him nah. in the draft room when it happened? Yeah. It was like, what the f did yeah, we just what do? what are we doing? Yeah. So, there's that. Hey, yo, Mike White. Hey, Mike White don't and be some hoop dogs. Look, it's off-season time. Go dabble in some hoops if you haven't, man. I'm telling you, it, it, this is quite possibly the best Georgia basketball team that's been around since they made the dance and played Michigan State in Mark Fo with Mark Fox. I mean, it is – I was like Ant Man too. Ant Man yeah. was fun because just mm -hmm. because Anthony Edwards is the number one overall pick, but Bro, like this unit, they've won ten games in a row, eleven games 11. in a row for the first time since nineteen forty eight. Nineteen forty eight, and it wasn't a bunch of slappies. No, like they've when two SEC teams the last yeah, two they're two games. and on the SEC for the like first time Tom, in like thirty years. I think Tom Crean at one point had like a nine game win streak or something like that, but it was a bunch of, <laughs> against a bunch of schools that you'd never heard of. Like this, they beat Wake Forest, they beat Florida State, they beat Georgia Tech, and now they've beaten two SEC opponents, Missouri who's no slappy in the SEC, and then Arkansas, who was a legitimate contender last year. And just spent a boatload of money in the transfer portal to add a bunch of players onto their roster. So mm -hmm. um, how about Mike White? Let's do it again. Mike White, give him three. <laughs> I, I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was in trouble when I'm on the radio and folks out here asking me Mike White questions, and I'm like, hey, dog, I only got so much bandwidth, and it ain't for that round bouncing thing. You know what I mean? Um, I'm a football guy. I think honestly, what I, I th all the tr transfer port acquisitions that they made this offseason, a lot of them have been fantastic. A lot of them are the starting lineup. But I think honestly, what makes Georgia dangerous to a lot of other teams 
is the depth that they have. Yeah. I think Georgia's um, bench has outscored the opposing team's bench 66 to 22 in the last like three games or something like that. It's it's absurd. You have and a guy they play like, great defense too. They play good defense. Just like you have Justin Hill coming off of the bench. That's an experienced veteran basketball player, point guard, a guy that can run the point. Like like I mean, it's just. I think that's where they're getting them. It, the starters are great. Noah Thomason, that's really he's really fun to watch. Uh, Silas Demery, the uh, a freshman point guard, he's fun to watch. About Blue Kane, like just oh, a bunch of fun players. What to watch. a name, Blue Kane. Got a white ponytail. IMG's finest. Yeah. Yeah, man. You got any hoops thoughts? No, I mean it's just it's fun to finally watch a Georgia basketball team where it's not like. Hopefully we we don't get beat by twenty today, yeah. or let's let's yeah. see if they blow this. It's actually you're actually vested in it. You're actually you go to the games and the crowd's into it now, which is something you don't see. You haven't seen a lot in the last few, now, or at least since I've been to UGA. Now they do play Tennessee on Saturday at home, Ooh. so pack the steg if you can. But that's that's going to be the tell of all tales. Like if you can go in there and you can match up and size up with a Tennessee team that's really freaking good, then that'll be the mark where it's like, okay, Mike White, this team. I mean, they're already getting postseason love. I, they're listed as a first four team out. I know that's not actually in the tournament just yet, but they're getting some recognition. All right. Does Kirby Smart chase down Nick Saban as a GOAT in no. the next 15 years? If, you, if you're if you guaranteeing me 15 years of Kirby Smart as a Georgia what football player. What if I said he has 10? No. He coaches at Georgia for 18 No, seasons. it's, it's too hard this. with the transfer portal and 12-team playoff now. How many undisputed GOATs are there in sports? One. Who's one? Wayne Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky. Okay, that's Wayne one. Wayne Gretzky is so far and away the greatest hockey player Tom Brady. Of all time. I, 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 I think know. there's some discrepancy there a little a bit. I think you could go three names in football. I think you could go LT, Jerry Rice, or Tom Brady. I'll step out a little bit, and I'll give you another one. Tony Hawk. I think that's a yeah, yeah, yeah. that's an undisputed yeah. Sean goat. White. Sean, Sean, White. White. Sean White. So, like, three. Goat. Three legitimate disputed goats, Nick Saban in that mix. You put Wait. Nick Saban in that mix for just college football? Yeah, I think I mean, he's, he's an a, undisputed yeah, no, coach. No, he is. He's yeah. undisputed the greatest college football coach of all time. But the coaching profession just doesn't exist in college football. Mm -mm. College football coaches or coaches in general, how would, is it even fair like I did on Twitter today? By the way, every once in a while, we're out here just baiting. Um, <laughs> and we were baiting today. We were baiting today with the Nick Saban uh, versus Bill Belichick debate. Um, is it a fair debate to have? Um, or really, you no, just say both are goats. No, it's apples to oranges comparing the NFL uh, to college football. See, no, Tiger Tiger doesn't fit in this mix because no. Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no. And I'm, MJ doesn't because of LeBron. Like, yeah. there's, it's undisputed because if you ask anybody, they're going to say Nick Saban. How about Dale Earnhardt? Mm. I don't know enough about NASCAR. I don't know enough about no. NASCAR. I, I've watched maybe I think, a minute uh, of NASCAR in my who life. Was, this is how much I know about NASCAR. Who were the, the Lowe's 48 car? Who was that? Jimmy oh, Johnson. Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy Johnson got to be the goat, right? Didn't he win like seven of those fucking Winston sure. Cups? Yeah, sure. There's he did two. what in his cup? Um, yeah, we don't know much about NASCAR here, but <laughs> it is what it is. Hey, do you like the Cars reference right there? Yeah. Did. Um, hey, we'll see you guys on Monday. I love you. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button on your way out. We'll see you. Oh, Serena Williams. Good shout out. Serena. Ah, oh, Serena.